<clears throat> Hello, Holly. Hello. How are you? How are you doing? <laughs> yeah, everything's good, Jules. Um, we only got hit by a little bit. Nothing crazy either, so that was nice. I mean, uh, a couple hours ago, it was like rain, hail, thunder, lightning, all the, that type of stuff, and then it was like clear skies. So, yeah, all well on the home front. Thank you for asking. I just wasn't really sure, so I didn't want to say, hey, I'm doing it, and uh, then not show up. So that's why my TikTok story was a little bit strange. Hello, Amber. Thank you so much for uh, doing that whole YouTube thing. Um, Amber has been posting where all the YouTube stuff actually starts, so that's really nice. So if you guys ever go back and watch any of the YouTubes, just look in the comments for when the actual... Uh, the, whatever we're going through when it actually starts. Um, cause she, she puts that in the comments and that's really nice. So hello, Jody or Jubesy, Jubesy bear. Hello, Lord Farquaad. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, Mark salvation is through knowledge and science, not fables. Ooh, I would, uh, I, I, I disagree. I have revelation six left. Okay. What's up, Abby? Hello. 68 degrees right now. Nice. Nice. Um, wasn't that a band? Oh, no. That was 98 degrees. I'm totally messing, but you know what I'm talking about. What's up, Tony? How you doing, man? At Sheesh, how's it going? Going well. Going well. What's up, Arthur? Loved that uh, Disciples painting that you sent me, man. That was so neat. The The... Man, that was just that was a fun read. So I appreciate you sending me that. Uh, what book? Didn't see your story, but I looked. Oh, I didn't even put it in the story. But we're gonna go through Titus tonight. We'll we'll do the entire book of Titus Titus tonight, uh, and we'll 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 kind of go all over the place. I don't know. I I will say that I I don't think it'll take too long, because it's kind of like a recap of what we've already gone through. So it's just like one of those examples. Like, do we? wax long on these things that we've already hit. And it's so weird because, you know, I know there's people here who have been here time and time again. So they have like a good idea of uh, these Pauline epistles by now. So, but it's, it's always interesting because you guys, if you've been here for all the studies so far, you're probably like, okay, we get it. Yes. Okay. Paul. Yeah. Okay. And I'm just like, I hope you don't get like that because I'm like, I don't know who's in here. I don't know what they know. I, I don't know everybody's knowledge. So um, it's just one of those things um, but yes, Holly, hello, Jackie, what's up, Donna, how are you, Donna, good to see you, Jackie in the house, okay, oh, yes, <laughs> hello, 1920, you are here, dude, Jubesy Bear, that, every time I see your profile picture, it just cracks me up, seeing you makes my day, <laughs> very cool, Jenny, <laughs> Oh, man. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. That's good. That's good. Um, man, I don't know if you guys have seen some of those things that have been happening. Obviously, lots been going on. It is unbelievable. There are all kinds of things. Thanks, Yoen. 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 What's up? Sheesh. Hello, Mateo. I'm happy you are able to be here. Me too. Um... Yeah, but there's like, I mean, there's the earthquake going on over in Taiwan, buildings falling down, huge buildings. Um, obviously, the whole Damascus thing, which I'm sure you guys are very, very aware about at this point. But it is just so interesting watching this from America. All of these events unfold from America. And it's mind blowing because um, there used to be a time where even if the emperor of the world died, it used to take like six to seven months before the military, everybody in the army found out about it. That's crazy. Now we find something out and it's like, boom, it's right away. And so now we know exactly what's going on all over the place. And it's just unreal just to be alive. What a day to be alive. Um, it's really quite something. So, uh, yeah, obviously Israel strikes Damascus. This is nothing new. I, I don't know what you guys know or what you don't know, but Israel has been striking Damascus all the time. They It's just a constant 
battle going on, but it's like, uh, there's no war. They're just doing it nonchalantly. Like you guys ready for the next one? And then they, you know, they bomb them. But typically what they do is, uh, they'll attack their infrastructure. Like, uh, and they're not, they don't really take out lives. So, but this one was much different than the other ones. Cause typically what they have done in the past, at least, uh, and largely in part is attacking the airstrips over there in Syria. And that's, they were only doing that because, you know, Iran was bringing in all the weaponry and stuff and they were bringing in, that into that airport. So they were just taking that airport out of the equation so that it would be more difficult for them to get the weapons where they wanted it to be. So, you know, obviously this is a whole proxy war because Iran is like, you know, the person in the background, like the, the wizard behind the curtain, and they're just using their proxies like Hezbollah or Hamas, like all of these kind of people to do their dirty work for them. And so it's really fascinating seeing this all happen because Israel took out, you know, that, um, I, um, that mil uh, military leader. And <laughs> it's just, it is a bold move. That is, that is, that's a big, that's a big deal. So, I, you know, obviously it's going to take a couple of days before there's some retaliation and some effect to see if Iran's going to do something. Are they, are they not? Are they going to get more involved? We don't really know, but we'll find out sooner or later. And uh, what we do know is Ezekiel 38, 39 war seems to be right there. It just is unbelievable. 38, Ezekiel 38, 39, Gog and Magog, you have um, many, many scholars and, you know, all of this is prophecy it's all eschatological so nobody really knows exactly how or when the ezekiel 38 39 war is going to occur but many scholars believe that it's going to occur before the tribulation um you know you can study it yourself and see where you land after you study for yourself um but the way that if it if it begins before the tribulation maybe it's something that could kick off the tribulation or a way to bring peace into that into area which seems to make sense to me so the way that kind of seems to make sense is that um, in a prophetic timeline, it seems to make sense that the rap if the rapture occurs, if the rapture is the next thing that happens, which you guys know that I'm pre-trib, if the rapture is the next thing that happens, then imagine the chaos. Imagine the chaos on the, from, the, from the rest of the world. Imagine the chaos that's going on. And so that could, you know, it's already a tinderbox over there. And so one spark will just ignite this insane something and then... Um, you know, or it could, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's just really, it's really interesting, uh, seeing how all this could play out, but, uh, you have all the players that are on the board that need to be where they're, they're supposed to be. And, you know, <laughs> just crazy seeing, crazy seeing, do you think, uh, Russia and Ukraine is Gog and Magog? I think Russia is for sure. Russia is, um, Gog is going to be the leader. Um, at least that's what it, it seems to imply. Gog is the leader, Magog, the land, the people, um, the rapture will happen. And then suddenly war, war world peace. Yeah. Um, I think so. Something along those lines, amateur, there's going to be, uh, you know, Daniel nine twenty seven. we obviously know there's going to be world peace, especially over in the middle East. And that's very important to pay attention to as well. Hello. What's up, Mark? Good to see you. Um, but yeah, it's very fascinating. The Lord's enemies will eat defeat. Israel will eat defeat. <laughs> uh, what's up, DJ Nick? How are you tonight? Glad you could make it. I'm glad you could make it, man. Thanks for being here. Uh, you're always so excited with all the exclamation points. Is it an exclamation point or an exclamation mark? Is it an exclamation point? Or is it an exclamation mark? Ah, uh, take a poll, uh, free flowing information at our fingertips. Yeah, no kidding. Hello, Amanda Cook. Hello, Savannah. <laughs> What's up, Lainey? Good to see you. I'm so happy I can be here as well. Thank you so much. Oh, wait, did somebody, um, sometimes I look away. Um, oh, okay. That's all right. Okay. Exclamation point. Are you sure? Is it both? Paula says both. I, ha, okay, somebody... <laughs> Somebody look it up because I am really interested now. Exclamation mark or exclamation point. We should probably take a poll <laughs> before just so sheesh, you got my follow. Thanks, man. Um, I appreciate that. I, I uh, exclamation mark. See, we got we're we're, uh, we're divided. I don't know how to do a poll exactly. I forget. 
Um, talk, talking about Russia, what's your thoughts on Satan's seat location? Seems like it seems it seems to make the most sense. We, we talked about this about a year ago, Mark, um, when we went through Revelation. Because in Revelation, uh, oh man, I'm drawing a blank now. Uh, it talks about where Satan, uh, with Satan's throne is, and that seems to be the most the thing, thing that makes the most sense is uh, over in Geneva, um, Switzerland. If I had to make a, uh, if I had to make a guess, that's what I would say. It's is it in Switzerland? Yeah, it seems to make the most sense there. Uh, point, point, exclamation point. Did you look it up or are you just saying it? Because you want me to talk about it? Is it okay? No, I I don't know. Um, exclamation point. It could be both. I'm doing great. Okay, it could be both. <laughs> that makes me feel so much better. I was about to have a massive where CERN is. Yeah, for sure, Mateo. It's just it's just very dubious seeing how this entire like you look back and you see all of these things happen. Right. Like uh, Israel, 1948, Geneva, the who 1948. You see all of these things coinciding with one another. And it's just like, OK, um, but you and I have the privilege to look back and see all of that stuff and see the dates. And we have all the information right here. So it's very fascinating show uh, shows, I think, possibly Turkey in the Bible. Yeah, maybe. I, I don't know. I, you know, it's hard to be definitive, but um, we went through. Well, now I want to find it. Where Satan's throne is. Where Satan's throne is. What is that? What chapter is that? Hello, Shelba. Both, Jenny. Did you look it up? Revelation 2. Okay, Revelation 2. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Pergamus. Yes. Pergamum. Um, I'm guilty. I did. Good. So, uh, so do you think that we are close to the rapture? I think so, Holly. I, I, I mean, you've been here, Holly, the whole time for the most part. Um, We've been going through, I mean, you were here since Revelation, so I've told you guys, before we even started our very first book, I told you yeah, that I think the rapture will occur in my lifetime, and I still believe that. I think it is just unbelievably, like, we are, like, we started up here where it's like, like, things don't happen very fast, but now we're down at the bottom of the vortex, it seems, and things are just rapidly speeding up. So, yes, I do. Um I do too. Yeah, Kim, I think so. You made it. Hello, Chelsea. Good to see you. Good to see you. I am glad you're here. Hopefully, hopefully you can hang out for a little bit. And if not, totally understand, but it is good to see you. And it's good to see everybody. That is so much. That is so fun. Um, so we are going to go through the book of Titus tonight. Good evening, Barb. Um, good evening, Barb. Does anyone think we need to prep like a lot or are saying no? Um, Lainey, I, we've, we've talked about this before too. I think, um, you already know what time it is. Um, we've, we've talked about that in the past. I think if you have the ability to, I think it's always prudent to have supplies, food, money, whatever, just on hand. I think that's like a good rule of thumb, no matter what time it is. That's just, that's just good to operate that way. Cause you never know. It's funny because we are so reliant on the manufacturers. Like we don't know how to go out and provide for ourselves. Like if the store shut down, we don't know how to live because we're, we just go, we're so used to going into a store and buying. So it's always good to have books on hand and, you know, like hard copies of things so that you can learn, learn how to plant, learn how to, you know, um, whatever, kind of make soaps, detergent, like all of that type of stuff. Um, and I'm a big, big advocate for that type of living. Um, the more you learn about what they put into our foods and whatnot, the more you're like, ah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, you get it. I looked it up. It says, uh, the same point and mark. So it's exclamation point and exclamation mark. Okay. S someone has said Noah was the ultimate prepper. <laughs> nice. Uh, I do. Farm girl here. Very cool. Good for you, Holly. A farm girl in a Corvette. It's not a not a normal 
kind of combination you see there. <laughs> Coffee time! What's the Bev of choice? Um, the Bev. The Bev is a Jocko. Go get you some Jocko. Jocko, go. I don't know if Katie's in here, but she was like, you're going to have Jockos and tacos? And I was like, I have not thought of it, but now it's on my mind, and now I want some tacos as well. I hope we learn where P. Diddy is before the rapture. Oh, my gosh. Uh, what's up, Fluter? <laughs> Glad to see you. Oh, man. Good to see you, Michelle. God bless. Looking forward to hanging out. Oh, very cool, Chelsea. Um, Barb, I'm glad you are here. Uh, Corvettes are fun and, on country roads. So <laughs> what's up, Eli? Good to see you, man. Hello, Ryan and everyone. Blondie. Oh, man. I said it was both. I know Paula. Paula was right from the get-go. She was like, it's both. Just, you know, and she, like, comes out. She's like, it's both, and then goes right back out. And she's like, where is she going to pop out next? Nobody knows. Um, hello, Sheena. Oh, thanks, Jeffrey. Appreciate it. Having tacos for dinner tomorrow. Oh, man. You know what? I just love Mexican food. It's it's one of those, I don't know how you guys are, and I know it's terrible for me, but Taco Bell, man. Oh, just smacks. Or like, oh, just give me some of that. I get a dang quesadilla. What's your favorite meal? Ooh, uh, chicken parmesan with some spicy sauce. If you can make it with some spicy sauce. Mm. Uh, my name is Landy. First time here. Well, thanks for being here, Landy. I will try to remember your name, especially if you keep coming back. Um, Landy. 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 The Logo Serpent. Sai. Taco Bell. Oh, come on, Mateo. Taco Bell isn't Mexican food. I know. <laughs> Real Mexican food. I know. We go to this one place that's, like, legit Mexican. But, you know, it's got a, you know, it's they got spicy stuff, and it's probably just food that's not real um what's your favorite meal jenny why can't you be my friend she should move to arizona oh man well i come from a family of educators <laughs> okay <laughs> so so you're you're really smart then okay well if i ever have any questions i will i'll i'll see if paula's in the house what's up it's all hello how you guys doing with the storms doing good so far um, I think it seems to be passed, which is very good. Taco Bell, Ryan, really? You need authentic tacos. Oh, you already know. Yeah, I, I, I go to a, an authentic taco place, um, and I get the same thing every single time. I'm one of those people. I, I don't like to go out and try a whole bunch of different new things, because when I find something I like, I will just... I'm home. But chips and salsa, you know how they bring you like a basket of chips and salsa? That thing is gone so fast it is it's it's unhealthy and <clears throat> it's delicious fresh made tortillas the same <laughs> indian tacos chipotle i enjoy some chipotle come to texas everyone else is <laughs> <laughs> fresh made tortillas only about grammar sorry okay um well i just got to say that you didn't use a comma in that or a period so um and let me see what else can I critique here. Only about grammar. You know, the preposition is a little... Oh, I'm just messing with you. Uh, I'm just messing. Hello, Gina! Eight servings of chips and salsa before they get a chance to take the order. Right! I'm glad you guys are with me on that because it is just like going... Just slamming chips and salsa. It's nobody's business. This is free? Are you kidding me? It's like I don't need anything else. Um... <laughs> You gotta try polish. Oh, polish, <laughs> polish. <laughs> Same. Oh man. Okay, 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 okay. New Mexican green chili. That sounds good. I'm not sure the correct. That's the correct term. <laughs> What's up, Carson? How are you? How are you doing? What would you? Uh, what would you consider the age of knowledge is? Oh, okay, I thought you were talking about something different. What would you consider age of knowledge is? Like our children being raptured? I think it's going to be different. I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about food, and I took that completely the wrong way because I'm reading from the bottom up. You know, I started from the bottom, and now I'm here. Um, <clears throat> um, 
But it's, uh, would, uh, what would you consider age of knowledge is like our children being raptured? Here's the question. Um, I would say, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be different depending on the, you know, and this is, God's going to be the perfect judge, obviously. <laughs> so my oldest is seven years old and we have been pouring into her since she was, she, she came out of the womb. Like when she was, you know, right here doing the whole skin to skin thing, like we were singing, telling her about Jesus. And so from, for seven straight years, we've been telling her about Jesus. And so somebody like that might have a, a lower type of, you know, like maybe six years old, maybe when she came, came to the realization of what sin was, because we always do true and false. We quiz her on all these things just to test her on knowledge and understanding as we drive throughout the town, when we got 15 minutes in the car or whatever. Um, so somebody like that, I think, I think she's, she might already be there. And that's just an interesting thing. So, you know, it's, 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 a, you know, so it's, it's really hard to say. I don't know. I would, if I had to guess, I'd say probably about eight years old, eight years old on uh, average, I would, I would guess. Um, some people, some kids probably older because they don't understand things. You know, there's people who are, learn at a slower pace, um, like myself. <laughs> uh, I need to listen to something three times before I actually understand what was just happening there. So I think that's why, like when, like when I actually understand something, I think that's why I can throw it to somebody else to where they can grasp it because I like, I, I, um, but it, it, it's, uh, you know, some kids grow, you know, my brother, for example, example, he is super intelligent and that guy, like he, he was like doing calculus when he was six. It's just like, <laughs> I hate you so much. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that's what I would guess somewhere around there. Um, oh, thanks, Paula. We are, uh, trying to do our best. Um, made marbleized fat, but, uh, not muscle in the body. No, I didn't know that. I think it will vary due to spirituality. Yeah. Age of accountability. Yeah. Is she, what she's talking about. Um, <clears throat> it's always interesting trying to figure out how old David's son was when he died. Because when David's son died, like he was, he like while he was dying, he was a hot mess. But then once he died, he's just like, you know what? He can't come to me, but I can go to him. Um, you know, we got a lot of hope, and uh, we're going to be talking about our blessed hope tonight. So we can go ahead and get started here. But I, I think that was that was good. Um, my son just turned six. He's always talking about Jesus and how he loves Jesus, and I love it. Good for you, Sarah. Keep keep pouring into him. You know, it's it's on you. And it is on me and it is on every other parent in this room to to raise up their children how they need to be raised. And so we we you know, that's going to come into play a little bit here because we just finished first and second Timothy the other night. And um, what you learn is that Timothy was raised by his grandmother and his mother meaning his father was not doing anything spiritually, right? Like he might've been out doing the hard work or whatever, but as far as being raised spiritually, it was on the grandmother and the mother. And I love that because it shows you how important it is to do because Timothy is, he's kind of like a big player, right? Like he, he's got two letters written to him that are in the Bible. I mean, like he's a big deal, uh, and it's interesting because the question on the table is, would he have been in here if his grandmother and mother did not raise him up how they did? And that is just unbelievable to think about. Imagine his grandma and, and mother just not doing it. Just like, hey, I understand it. I got all this knowledge, but I'm not going to give it to anybody else. And so that's the way to look at Timothy because Timothy was raised up from a young age by his grandma and his mother, Eunice and Lois. And, you know, that is, uh, that's important for all of us to understand whether you're in a strong relationship with your husband and wife, then you're doing good because now you're tag teaming, you know, your, your children and raising them up how they should be raised. But if you're in a relationship where the wife is not a Christian, but the man is, or the man is not a Christian, but the wife is, it shows you that it can be done and it still should be done. It's not going to be easier. It's going to be harder, but it still can be done. <clears throat> so I have three girls and one grown and married. So I do understand how important it is to teach them. Yes. How old are you, Sheesh? I am 35. Um, have you seen The Cessationist? It's on Amazon. So informative. I have not. 
I have not seen it. Um, and Superbook is even better. It uses the Bible to solve modern day problems. Um, we watch a lot of that. Uh, that is like our go-to, you know, that's like the new, new 2024, eight, like uh, the 2024, uh, their version of, uh, Adventures and Odyssey. I don't know if you guys ever watched Adventures and Odyssey, but I, I loved, uh, and I still would, like, I'd still, like, if we're going on a road trip, I will push one of those tapes in the, the cassette player and I will listen to that whole book. Oh man. Yes. Oh man. Jubesy trying to set me up. I got banned last time I talked about that, but okay. You could get saved in Catholic church too. What? What do what do you, what, what are you, did you just work? Did I miss a part of a conversation? Um, okay. I used to listen to that. Yes, me too. Uh, iBible is great for kiddos. It's videos. iBible, 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 um, iBible. I have Is that, what is that Chelsea? Is that, uh, is that like, uh, adventures and odyssey super or super book type of material? Um, and just to expound on that question. No, no, no. Jubesy. No, it's just, no, I, I, I don't know. I don't think you're coming from a wrong place, but I, people come in here and they try to, troll by getting people to say certain phrases and that's why people have to say the word corn instead of you know the other word because it flags you and then if you get reported by somebody who doesn't like what you're trying to talk about here you know that's a very sensitive topic but you know Romans 1 talks a lot about that and I think our world is um we're all a mess we're all you know we're all sinners and it's uh it's something that we need to try to reach other people for, but we need to reach them with love because if, you know, all those people out there are holding picket signs and like saying, you're going to hell and all this kind of stuff, like that's not the way to do it at all. You don't see that anywhere in the Bible. And so Christians get a bad rap because of all of these fake Christians out there. And then the real Christians get that, like are left picking up the pieces, trying to put everything together, like in a loving kind of way. And so then everybody's confused. Are you a real Christian? Are you fake? Are you just, you know, who are you? And so, you know, um, trying to tell people, you know, it's, it's not on us to go and to force somebody to change their life. It is on us to give them the good news. And so if somebody accepts Christ and it's a genuine faith, if it is a genuine faith and you could fill in the blank for any kind of sin, right? Because we all sin, but you just fill in the blank for any kind of sin. If you accept Christ and it's genuine, then the Holy Spirit should be doing the work and getting stuff out and saying, this needs to go and I got to get rid of this. And then, you know, it says in first John that you cannot sin. It means that you, you can, but it'd be like the equivalent of drinking gasoline. Meaning once you wake up to the idea of like, oh, that's sin. I didn't know that before. Oh, that's sin. I didn't know that before. And then if you keep doing it, you're like, oh, so it's like drinking gasoline where you can do it if you want to. But if you do it, you're going to feel terrible. You're going to be like, I can't. And then when you, it's unbelievable because the more you understand about what you are saved from, then the more you should want to demonstrate that to the one who saved you. But you find that not being true. And it's so interesting because I just had an hour over an hour long conversation with, with my buddy on the phone today is actually like like two hours ago or three hours ago, actually. And him and I were talking on the phone and um, I, we were just talking about the uh, um, the signs of the times, everything. And, and he's like, man, I don't mean to get all conspiratorial conspiracy on you or whatever. And I was like, oh, dude, don't worry about it. Like, you're not like I'm probably more in there than you are. He's like, Oh, I doubt it. And so anyways, I asked him, I was like, Hey man, I don't know if I've ever talked to you about this, but I've ever asked you like, like, how do you know for sure you're going to heaven? And, um, so we started getting down that entire thing and we had this whole long conversation and I was picking his brain about it. And it was a really, really good conversation. And then he told me, he's like, you know what, man? Cause I've known this guy for about two years now. And he said, um, I asked him the question. I was like, if you were on the, if you were, if you were, uh, if, if you were arrested and you were put on trial, would there be enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? And he's like, man, uh, he's like, I don't know, man. He's like, I mean, maybe 50, 50, it's like 50, 50. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Maybe. I don't know. It's like, that's a hard thing to say. And I was like, you know, it's, that's okay. And I'm not trying to, you know, convict you to change or anything like that. I'm just, I just find it very interesting. And so we get in this entire, entire message 
And he told me, he's like, you know what? He's like, actually, the first time I actually talked to you, you asked me if I was a Christian. And I knew right away that you were a Christian because of everything you were talking about. <laughs> and I started laughing. I was like, I don't remember that, but that is so cool because from that guy's perspective towards me, he's like, I knew you were. He's like, you told me right when we first met. And I was like, that's so stinking cool. I was like, so right, aw right away, you would have been able to convict me of being a Christian because I was living it outwardly. I was like, that's what we need to be doing. Like people, like <clears throat> I told him about the, the time where my one buddy who was the coolest, the, the nicest, the most loving kind of person, but he was an atheist. And I was like, you are the most cool, like the coolest guy, the most loving type, type of person too. I was like, but if you put you next to him, what's the difference? I was like, he's an awesome dude who loves everybody and would give the shirt off his back. And so are you, but he's, he's an atheist and he, you're a Christian. So how would I pick which one's who? I was like, the only way people are going to know is if you tell them. I was like, so you don't think that you're just going to be able to win somebody by being a nice person. That's you're doing what you should be doing in, as like a generalization. But, you know, there's going to be a little bit more that needs to uh, like, there's got to be some meat on those bones, if that makes sense. So very cool. I know, right? Yeah, I'm very. I started laughing. I started laughing. Oh, Holly, thank you so much. Holly. I wrote Holly a song and I'm going to sing it. <clears throat> Here we go. No, I'm not. I did not write her song. Um, but okay. Evangelism explosion. That sounds like, um, okay. Oh, thank you, Jenny. I appreciate that. I Bible, I Bible is by revelation media. If you type that into Google, it comes up for those who asked. Okay. I asked, um, Chelsea, if you could send me a link on that, that would be nice because we look for other things. If you, um, think if you give the thumbs up, <clears throat> then if you, if there's, if there's like a TikTok video or something like that, that'd be cool because I don't know if I'll remember at the end of this. Um, I will. It's amazing and accurate. Very cool. Thank you so much. Um, hello, Katarina. Okay. So hello. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my goodness. Holy. Oh man, let's go karaoke. Am I right? Uh, but we're known by the fruit of our spirit. Yeah. Um, there's something to be said about that, but a lot of times, um, <clears throat> I don't know. It's good to always, uh, mix in some good old, good old fashioned witnessing every now and then you're Agnes. Hello, Agnes. Um, hello, candy. Okay, guys, we can go ahead and get started. Um, now that candy is here. Uh, we were waiting for her, and now that she's arrived, we will go ahead and get started. Um, so it's about time, man, Candy. I was—I I didn't think that you were going to show up here. So, whew, I was getting worried, but now that you're here, no, I'm—I'm I'm totally me messing. Okay. Titus, we are going through Titus tonight, guys. And if you guys are new here, thank you so much for being here. My name is Ryan. I'm like, what? <laughs> What's up, Heather? I'm telling Oh, that's what we are waiting for. Yeah, Candy. Is that even her name? Um, I don't even know. Is she is that is she a bot? I don't know. Candy, are you real? I think you're real. I don't know. Um, I, I uh, me why me? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um why me? Thank you. No, I was totally kidding. Uh, yeah, I'm excited. I love your breakdowns. Breakdown. Okay. Yay, Candy. Hope so. Okay. Um, I fell asleep the other night. Did you all say you learned crown for looking forward to it? The coming. Yeah. Um, Sheena, is there a crown for looking forward to his coming is what Sheena's question is. Hi, Tamara. How are you? Um, <clears throat> yes. Okay. Whoop, whoop. So, it seems to make that, it seems to imply that, um, who is that? Sheena. Yeah. Sheena in second Timothy chapter four, verse eight, second Timothy chapter four, verse eight. And so the only way, you know, and you can wrestle a lot of this stuff that we talk about, it's very, very difficult to say, this is exactly how it's going to work because I can't say that it's very, you know, this is so far above, we're getting a peek through the keyhole, right? Like we're looking and we're trying to get the whole picture by looking through a little keyhole. That's what we're doing by diving into the Bible to when we're, when we're talking about prophetic things. And so when you read second Timothy chapter four, verse eight, it says, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge 
will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So on that, it just, it seems to make sense to me. And, uh, you know, you can see it differently and that's okay. Um, but it says to all who loved his appearing. Now, does this mean that every single person is going to get a crown? Because who would not love his appearing? Well, the people who don't think the rapture is even a thing. That doesn't, you know, like they, they weren't even looking forward to that. Like maybe that has something to it. That makes sense to me. Maybe people who are ashamed at his uh, coming because, you know, it talks about how may we not be ashamed. You know, it talks about that in multiple places. We, we tracked all those passages down. So maybe they won't be, you know, super, but like, Paul, I don't know. It seems like I take this at face value, at least to face value to me. It seems like when those people who are tracking the whole harpazo, the, the snatching, the, the, the seizing away, snatching away by force, um, seems to make sense. So it's not Paul isn't going to isn't the only one that's going to get it, but everybody else is who is going to love his appearing. And there's a difference between the rapture and the second coming. Um, so we've talked about that as well. Uh, all right. So we can go ahead and get into, um, hello, Michelle. I'm digging in, in digging your preaching in digging. Okay. I felt, okay. So hopefully that makes sense. What's a har harpazo again caught up. Yeah. It's har. Um, yeah, I think you meant to hit a P there, Holly or, um, uh, Heather it's H A R P. A -Z -O. But yeah, that's harpazo. It's just, um, you know, it, uh, harpazo is Greek. Latin word is raptoro, rapio. And we derive that word to our English word from Latin because people are like, oh, the word rapture is not even in the Bible. Well, the Bible wasn't written in English. So if you go and read what it was written actually down in, then you'll see the harpazo and raptoro and you'll see that we derive our English word from Latin, which is rapture. So yeah, Harpazo. Yes, Heather, for sure. Okay, so we can go ahead and get into um, this study. We're going to be covering Titus. We're going to be covering all 16 chapters tonight. And um, when I say 16, I just mean three. There's only three chapters. And so if you thought we were going to do 16 chapters, and well, I would be like, did you think there were 16 chapters in Titus? And then I'd be like, um, okay, so before we start, um, thank you guys so much for being here. My name is Ryan. For you guys who are new, I am just a guy, just, you know, just, you know, just somebody who is putting a camera on my face and you guys are watching me wherever you're at. And um, we're just going through the Bible verse by verse, book by book. And uh, we've covered a handful of uh, books already. We've got Revelation, Daniel, Ruth, John, Hebrews, James, Acts, Romans, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, and now we are going into Titus. And so all of these books, all of these videos, I just copy and paste these up to YouTube. There's a YouTube link in my TikTok profile. If you guys wanted to go subscribe over there, that'd be cool. Just because if they ban TikTok, then we'd have no way of talking about Mexican food. And then you can't see me watch, you can't watch me drink Jocko's anymore. And this, this whole thing. And then everybody gets all of it. No, I'm, um, but I upload these on YouTube. So if you guys want to go check that out, there's a YouTube link in my TikTok profile. So that is there if you want to use that as a resource. And you can go back, rewind, fast forward, pause, play, whatever you want to do, because I do talk fast. And uh, sometimes, you know, it's 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 too fast. And I do think about that. But I, 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 I thought about trying to slow down. And I feel like if I try to slow down, then I'll lose where I'm going with the thought. <laughs> so I don't know if I can do that. <clears throat> Anyways, um, so we're going to be going to the book of Titus tonight, but I want you guys to understand that w what we talk about for the most part is secondary issues. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, we can talk about our love of coffee. Of coffee. Um, but what we talk about for the most part here tonight is going to be secondary issues, but I would, you can disagree with me on some of these things that we're going to talk about. That's okay. But what I want you to understand more than anything is to how to know for sure you can get to heaven. That's the biggest thing. I was talking to my buddy tonight and I asked him, I was like, do you know your phone number? Do you know your social security number? Do you know your address? And he's like, yeah, I know it. And I was like, but do you know where you're spending eternity? And he started laughing. He's like, I see what you're doing there. I was like, yeah, isn't it crazy? I was like, we know so much about the things that we can see physically but we don't spend that much time researching or studying about what's coming next. Because if this whole line is uh, eternity, 
And this little clicker thing, hey, thanks, Tamara. If this little clicker thing is our life from here to here, this little, little half inch is our entire life from birth to death. And from here to here is eternity. Why do we spend so much time on this short little clicky thing? And we don't even think about what's coming up. And I'm like, that just doesn't make any sense. And so we got on this whole, whole topic about how, how we've been born and raised to think incorrectly on all kinds of different levels, you know, like all the things that everybody's waking up to. And then, but if you look at American version of Christianity, it's the same concept. I was like, use your, all the conspiracies that you guys have unpacked for yourselves. You know how you've woken up. I was like, use that same lens on the Bible because it, it should make you think that we've been doing it wrong. We go to church once a week for one hour and we label that as that's good. That's a good Christian. That's what Christians do. It used to be Christians don't drink, smoke, or cuss. And now, now Christians do all of those things. Now Christians drink, smoke, cuss, they sleep around, they do whatever they want to do. And it's just like, well, how do we pick and choose? Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to you know, you know, throw shade on anybody. I'm just trying to like, the more you dive into the word of God. And I told you, told this to my buddy tonight, his name is Craig. I told this to Craig tonight. I said, man, this is, this book has really been working on me. And specifically, it's really been working on me since I'm like trying to study it for you guys. And so I'm benefiting a lot more. And, uh, I like, it is like, (laughs) so it is unreal. But the one thing I want you guys to understand more than anything else, the primary issue, the thing that I was getting at is to know for sure how to get to heaven. There's only one way. And that way is by believing that Jesus is God's son, that he led a sinless life, that he died on the cross for your sins and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day. And the Bible says, for whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want you guys to know that more than anything. And it's not something you can earn. You don't deserve it. It is a free gift. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for, God, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That is what I want you to take away from everything that we're talking about. If you don't know that, message me here on TikTok. You don't need to follow me or anything like that. My messages are open for anybody and everybody. If you have any questions about anything, I would love to talk to you. But Um, thank you so much for, um, being here, but that's the one thing that I want you to understand more than anything, because that is everything. It is everything. Okay. So let's go ahead and get on into, um, Titus. So Titus, we are going through these Pauline epistles and it's really cool. Um, you know, we're, I don't know, what do we got left? First and second Corinthians and Philemon. I think first and second Corinthians and Philemon are the last two Pauline epistles that we need to do. So that means that we've done about 11 Pauline epistles then. Um, Cause if you count Hebrews, then, you know, um, but anyways, it's uh, Paul, Paul, I, if you guys have been here for any of those studies, I hope you guys are really getting to know him. Like, like, I don't see how you can be here for those studies and not get to know him. Because for me, I'm just like, every time I go through like the recaps and stuff, I'm like, this is unbelievable. This actually happened. Paul actually had an encounter with Jesus Christ. He actually changed his life. He went for like the bizarre change. And so anyways, Paul is the guy who writes this letter and he writes this letter to a guy named Titus. But you need to understand Paul where he came from. Just a short background on who Paul is. He is a Hebrew of Hebrews. He is a Pharisee of Pharisees. And what I mean by that is he was the guy who was looked up to, to hold everybody else accountable for the law. He was a part of the Sanhedrin. Many people speculate, you know, just because um, of all the, the, the background that we're given about him, but he was an expert of the law. He was trained up under a guy named Gamaliel, Gamaliel we're told. And Gamaliel was one of those high end uh, philosophers, just like uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, those kind of guys. And so when you look at Paul, I want you guys, I want you to put Paul above those guys. Paul was insanely intelligent. And when you mix in the divine revelation that he was given by God himself, then you can understand that Paul knew so much more than what he actually probably told us. I mean, it's funny that this encounter with Jesus, that he doesn't give us descriptions about what like certain because we're, he tells us a little bit about his encounter with on the road to, to Damascus, but he he almost casually says that he he was given a revelation by Jesus in some of his other epistles, and it's fascinating 
Because if that was you or I in our American world today, we would have made a whole TikTok story about it. And I would have told you all about what I saw. And I would have gone on and on about what the things that everybody wants to see and the things that tickle people's ears. But Paul doesn't do any of that. He just gives it to you straight. And he's like, this is what he said. This is what we need to do. And it's not it's not what you know a man would actually write. This book doesn't make any sense if it was written by man. We wouldn't come up with this kind of stuff. And so obviously it is God breathed. That's what 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us. It is God breathed uh, divine inspiration, which is the idea of Greek um, uh, God breathed. So that's Paul. He changes his life around after his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And so he goes from persecuting the church to being the tip of the spear for furthering the gospel. And he was living so out loudly. Like he would not have been somebody. I, I was thinking about this today, actually. I forget what thought I was running through my mind, but the thought entered my brain. Like Paul, like if he showed up and he, like, cause Paul is, so we're reading first and second Timothy and we're about to dive into Titus and these are pastoral epistles. And so it's fascinating because Paul is writing to Timothy and he's writing to Titus and he's telling them what to do in regards to the church. And so when you think about Paul, how do you think, cause he encourages Timothy, he encourages Titus. He tells him, he's like, Hey, keep doing this, keep doing this. What would he say about you and I? If he was going to write you a letter, like imagine your name at the top. Imagine it says Heather, Heather number one, Heather number two, or Lisa or Katerina or Jessica or, you know, uh, Mark or Grandma Sue or tr uh, tr uh, Trustin, uh, it, wh whoever. Imagine he writes you a letter and he's like, hey, you're doing a good job. Is he going to say you're doing a good job? I don't know. It's just one of those things that just makes you just like, oh, and so. It's so funny to see our American version of Christianity and to see, because in my estimation, it is extremely broken. It is extremely broken. We have lost our way. And so here, this is where it all kind of comes together. Like this is the order of church, first and second Timothy and Titus. We, we learn about the church order and we learn how things should operate within the church, within the body. The church is the bride. And so I don't know. It's it's just it's just very fascinating thinking about thinking about what what the letter would say if it, if this said first and second Ryan right hey go go ahead and turn to first Ryan chapter two verse six like what would it say it'd be like oh gosh don't look <laughs> oh my goodness I I'm just it's so it is I I uh. okay um so Titus so getting back to Titus it's 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 uh it's good to know that we talked about this just uh, we touched on it just a minute ago but this is uh, the la uh, this is a pastoral epistle first and second Timothy it's a pastoral epistle and so is Titus and this book or this letter was written around 65 AD if you guys remember before and I I I want to bring this up because you know it's kind of relevant in our world today but I told you guys before to kind of think of um, like little uh, checkpoints in the Bible to kind of help gauge where you're at within Scripture. And the first one that I wanted you to remember back in the Old Testament is um, the Daniel, like when Daniel had that prophecy, the prophecy, you know, the, the, the image, the, the, gold, the, the statue and the top was Babylon, the Medes and the Persians, the, the Alexander, the great, the Ro Roman empire and the revived Roman empire. You have that as like your first huge checkpoint, because that is just like the prophecy. And I don't want you guys to sleep on that fact on how amazing that prophecy actually is. Daniel quite literally told us what was going to happen for centuries to come. Like what Daniel talked about happened all the way past when Jesus died on the cross. That's unbelievable. He, I, I mean, why aren't we talking about that? Like, I, I mean, that's crazy. And so anyways, Daniel is that huge, like you look at that statue as like this huge checkpoint, right? And so then when you fast forward a little bit, you have the temple that falls in 70 AD. So those two checkpoints, you can look at those because those are massive events or, you know, those are just a, a way to look at it if you want to. You know, obviously the crucifixion is massive and I'm not taking anything away from that. I'm just saying that it's just interesting. You have this massive prophecy and then the massive prophecy being fulfilled. It's just a good way to know because it says here in AD 65 at the top of my my in my Bible, it says that this book was this epistle was written around 65 AD. And so this is right around this is about five years before 
the fall of the temple that happened in 70 AD. The first temple was built in by King, I'm sorry, uh, the first temple was built by King Solomon and it was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar. And so that's when Daniel goes into captivity. And so the, the first temple was completely destroyed. The second temple was built by Zerubbabel. It was revamped. It was, it was, it made, you know, more extravagant by King Herod. And then that temple, that second temple, that's the one where Jesus went into and he was teaching and preaching and all these things. That's where he chased everybody out of the, you know, all of those things. That is that temple. And so the temple here that, um, you know, Titus is writing this around 65 AD, the temple is still standing. That's crazy. Think about it. So Jesus died on the cross. He rose again from the third day and they are telling everybody about Jesus. But the temple is still standing. So the sacrifices are still happening. That's mind blowing. Think about like, think about how the, the sacrifices, the Levitical priesthood, like they were still going into the temple. They were still going all around these people and they were, um, they were still operating in the old Testament type of manner because they didn't know any better. Do you remember that veil being torn in two? Um, they are those aha moments. <laughs> okay. Um, aha. The veil being torn in two, it was emblematic that we no longer um, needed to, a high priest to go intercede for on our behalf because Christ is our the high priest. And so when we pray, he intercedes for us. And it's just, <laughs> okay. So anyways, so Titus, um, so while Timothy, because we talked about, we just finished writing uh, or going through first and second Timothy. And if you guys remember, and I'll oh, thank, what is that? What is that? Is that a, is that, what is that? Is that a bracelet? Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you, Paula. I always get confused on that one. It always think looks makes me think like it's a donut or something like that, and then I just get all excited. But it's um. Uh, so we just finished First and Second Timothy, and Timothy, when Paul was writing to the Timothy, Timothy was in Ephesus. Okay, so while Timothy is in Ephesus, Titus here is going to be in Crete. Hey, thank you for those flowers. Thank you so much. Um, best boy, mom. Thank you. Uh, but Titus is on the island of Crete. And that is interesting for all kinds of different levels because, well, number one, it's an island. But while we go through this book, I want you to remember that Crete is uh, engaged in a lot of mythology. Like they, they, they are involved in a lot of you know, the Greek gods and whatnot. And that's just, that's how their culture was. But Titus was a Gentile. So if you remember Timothy, so just to compare and contrast, because these are the pastoral epistles. He is writing the pastoral epistles to a guy named Timothy, which is what we covered. And now he's writing the other one to Titus. And so Timothy was half Jew, half Greek, half Gentile, half Jew, half Gentile. So that's why Paul had Timothy get circumcised. Oh, and um, so he had Timothy get circumcised because he didn't want the circumcision to be an issue. He didn't need to be circumcised to, in order to be saved. He just knew that they were going to stumble upon some Jewish people along the way. And he's like, I don't want this to be an issue whatsoever. I don't want this to be a barrier from them not having their ears open to what we have to say. And so since we're going to remove that barrier for the obstacle, then we're going to get this knocked out. And so that's what they did. A donut to go with the coffee. See, she knows. But so Titus was a Gentile. So let's go to Galatians chapter two. Galatians chapter two. In Galatians chapter two, verse three, it says, Galatians chapter two, verse three, it says, yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circ circumcised. So it tells us that a couple things here. It tells us that Titus was a Greek, which means he was a Gentile. So we learn that he's a Gentile. And then it tells us again that he was not, that Titus wasn't even compelled to be circumcised. So you get two things. Titus is a Gentile and he felt like he never needed to get circumcised. So this is a very important thing to pay it or to be mindful of because of the time that they were in. Now, remember who is writing here. This is Paul. Paul is a Hebrew of Hebrews. He is a Pharisee of Pharisees. Thank you, Candy. And um, he, out of everybody, should have been the one enforcing circumcision. Like, if you want to become a Jewish person, you got to get circumcised. You got to obey the law. You got to do this, 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 this. You got to get real legalistic. And you got to follow every single law, all the Pharisaic laws, every law that's ever been made. You got to follow that. And so that is what I want you to pay attention to. But here it tells us that Titus was a Gentile and that he didn't feel like he needed to be circumcised, which shows it's not about what, like, you can do whatever you want to. And these people, there's people out in the world, they think that by doing something or by not doing something, they are becoming more holier. 
that's crazy, right? Like more holier than thou. Like, hey, I'm not, I'm not going to eat this. And so I'm more holy than you. Or, hey, I got circumcised or I didn't get circumcised. And so I'm holier than you are. How dare you? Look at me. I'm better than you. Like, that's kind of like the mindset that was going on back then. But he served with Paul on special assignments. Um, like Titus was with uh, Titus was with Paul on a handful of other occasions. Just let's look up some of them real fast. Let's go to Second Corinthians. Thank you for those chilies. Um, it does go on today. You are right. Let's go to Second Corinthians chapter seven. So in Second Corinthians chapter seven, there's a couple mentions of Titus in Second Corinthians, but in Second Corinthians chapter seven verse thirteen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 13, it says, Therefore we have been comforted in your comfort, and we, we rejoiced exceedingly more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if in anything I have boasted to him about you, I am not ashamed, but as we spoke all things to you in truth, even so our boasting to Titus was found true. So Titus is clearly been in the game for a long, long time, we just don't know that much about them. But let's look up a little bit more. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, it says this. So we urge Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. So he's mentioned again there. But let's go to verse 16. 2 uh, Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 16, he's mentioned again. In verse 16, it says, but thanks be to God who puts the same earnest care for you in the heart of Titus. And so, and then we get to verse 23 in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23. This is probably the biggest thing that I need you out of all those verses we just looked up. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23 is the biggest thing to kind of really drive it home as far as who Titus was. 2 Corinthians 8, 23. This is Paul talking. If anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. Or if our brethren are inquired about, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. Okay, so that gives us a ton of information because now when you look at Titus, you're looking at him and Paul himself said that he is his partner. So you have Paul, Titus, Paul, Timothy, Paul, Timothy and Silas or Sylvanus. You have the these names that keep popping up, right? Paul and Barnabas. You have names that keep surfacing. But here in verse 23, it tells us that Paul, that Titus is Paul's partner. That's a big deal. I mean, that's a big deal. Okay. All right. So getting back to the epistle, uh, um, getting back to Titus, it's good to know Titus was responsible for the churches in Crete. Because you remember, he's on an island. He's on an island all by himself. And the island is called Crete. And so he's on that island, and his responsibility are the churches on that island. That's a big job, like all over the place, dealing with the mythology, trying to counter all of these things, how to balance everything. And so that, so, so, so Titus is there and Paul is writing him a letter concerning how to operate. And so that's kind of the idea of, as we go into this, this book. Um, but he, um, it's good. So he, he also accompanied, if you guys remember in Acts chapter 15, in Acts chapter 15, you have this whole Jerusalem council uh, situation going on. In Acts chapter 15, we'll turn there here in a second, but he, he accompanied Paul and Barnabas, because if you remember in Acts chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas actually go, and um, if you remember, the names are switched around because it's Barnabas and Paul, because order of the names are important to pay attention to. So it's we're told it's Barnabas and Paul in Acts chapter 15, because Barnabas was going to be the one who is like the leader in that kind of context, because remember, Paul was the one who was uh, persecuting the church. And so they'd rather see Barnabas and then Paul in the background rather than Paul in front and then Barnabas in the background. And so that's why the order of operations, the names, the, the, the names mentioned is important to pay attention to. Sometimes it's Aquila and Priscilla. Sometimes it's Priscilla and Aquila. And, you know, it's, it's whoever is kind of leading the charge in that kind of whatever context you're reading. Uh, Jacob and Esau, Esau and Jacob, Shem, Ham and Jepheth, you know, like all of these names, um, pay attention to him. 
at least the order of them. But let's go back to Galatians chapter 2. Um, and let's read Galatians chapter 2. We were just here a minute ago. But Galatians chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Then after 14 years I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. Okay. So this is referring to the Jerusalem council. Okay, so in Acts chapter, I'm sorry, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. So here, this is filling in some of the blanks that we didn't really have before. So let's go to Acts chapter 15, and hopefully this can kind of shine a light on it a little bit more. At least you can get a little feel. We've been here a handful of times because how can you not, when we're going through all these Pauline epistles, it's almost impossible not to keep going back to Acts chapter 15. But in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, it says, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and uh, certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. Now, it says Paul and Barnabas here, but when you go to uh, verse 12, Acts chapter 15, verse 12, it says, Then all the mul multitude kept silent and listened to Paul and Barnabas. So before Paul and Barnabas actually got there, it was Paul and Barnabas before they got there, but then once they arrived, then it became Barnabas and Paul. So hopefully you can see that. So um, in verse 3, Acts chapter 15, verse 3, it says, So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders. And they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So this was the issue that was on the table. At this Jerusalem council, you have all of these people who were born and raised by the law, and they were having a hard time getting over it. And so you can't really blame them for like trying to get people to fall in line according to their customs because it's what they grew up with. Like it's like, it's like taking your shoes off when you walk in. Can you imagine like somebody saying, Hey, you don't need to take your shoes off anymore. It's like, you're going to walk into a house and you're still going to feel like you're going to need to take your shoes off because that's how you were born and raised doing. Um, and so that's kind of like their, their, you know, connection to them because these people were struggling with it. They wanted people to abide by the law and they didn't understand exactly what was going on. And so that's why this whole council was put together because they were trying to all get on the same page because what they decided here echoed throughout time. They set the pace for the church right here in Acts chapter 15. So in Acts chapter 15, verse six, it says, now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He is talking about the Gentiles are receiving the Holy Spirit and the Jews also have the Holy Spirit. And he's like, what's going on? He's like, they already have the Holy Spirit. Why do they need to fall in line with the law? But in Acts chapter 15, verse 9, it said, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the necks of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. And I want you to pay attention to the posture of Peter's heart. Because in a Jewish mind, the Jew was always thinking about how they were the chosen one. Like they, like you go all the way back to Jew, Deuteronomy, it talks about how I will you know, choose a holy people for me, right? Like that's what God says. He's like, I'm going to choose my holy people referring to Israel. So the Jewish people always had like this, you know, sense of pride walking around as if like, you know, they were the big deal. And obviously, rightfully so, like that's a big deal to be God's chosen people. Like I'm not taking any way. That's, it's wonderful. But they had a hard time. These Jewish people had a hard time looking at Gentiles because the Gentiles, you and I, like we were just walking around like, I don't even know what to do. Like we're eating paint chips. We're just like licking windows and stuff. And they're looking at us like those guys 
really? And so we just, we were able to be grafted in and it, it was, it was because they rejected the, the kingdom when Jesus showed up. And so, you know, that's just this whole other conversation, but it's interesting. So Peter lowers himself and he says, he doesn't say that they're going to be saved like we are. He says that we will be saved as they are. So it's an interesting thing to kind of like see how his heart posture was because he's like, he's like, we can be saved like they, like putting them up, right? A little bit. It's it's a matter like it's it's the 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 word the language there is important to pay attention to, because it says in verse eleven that we shall be saved in the same manner as they, instead of saying they shall be saved like us right? It's, there's, there's a sense of pride there. It's like, almost like, Hey, look at me, look at me. You're going to be like me. He didn't say like, he he didn't say you're going to be like me. He said, I'm going to be like you. And that's, that's, that, that takes some humility right there. And Peter was coming around to it because it took Peter some time to get around to it. Uh, Anyways, verse 12, it says, then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. So you have this whole situation there. Um, you know, you go back to what is it, Acts chapter 10, Cornelius ends up getting the Holy Spirit um, and he was a Gentile. So Peter, a Jew from birth, is looking around and he's like looking at Cornelius and he's like, you got the Holy Spirit? He's like, you weren't born as a Jew. You, you don't observe the law. You don't, you're not circumcised. You don't do this or that or all these other things that we do. And wait, you have the Holy Spirit. That's mind blowing. So that was an interesting thing. But anyways, going back to Titus, it's just interesting to see that Titus was there. Titus was a part of it because that's what Galatians chapter two, verse one through five tells us. So you have Paul, Barnabas and Titus all there at the Jerusalem council. And then obviously you have James and Peter and some other big names. And we don't need to continue reading along in Acts chapter 15. So, all right. So um, there's three chapters in the book of Titus. And just to kind of give you like a little bit of an overview of like the topics of chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter one is going to be focusing on the elders. It's going to be focusing on the elders and how to put things in order. Like how do, how do you set things up? So that's what chapter one is going to be. Chapter two is going to be talking about the classes within the church in particular, and it's going to be more focusing on the doctrine. It's going to, you're going to have some doctrinal stuff going on in chapter two. And then in chapter three, it's going to be addressed to the members in within the church, like you and I, like if you're a member of a church, chapter three is going to be talking to you and it's going to be talking about maintaining good works because good works are important. And we'll talk on that when we actually get there. Okay, so we can go ahead and dive into Titus chapter one. Okay. In Titus chapter one, it says, Titus chapter one, verse one, um, Titus chapter one, verse one, it says, Paul, a bond servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect. (laughs) Thanks, Monami. Thank you so much. According to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which accords with godliness. Okay. Um, it's very, uh, you have, you have a, a whole bunch, you know, here we get into the salutation that Paul is writing and as per usual, I'm sure you guys are already, hopefully, is there anybody who already has an idea on some of the things I'm going to say? Because if you know some of the things that I'm going to say, then that's really good because you're paying attention and you're writing things down and you're, you're recognizing a pattern. First Peter chapter one, verse two. Yes. So, um, yeah, <laughs> very cool. So it says Paul, a bond servant. First off, remember what Paul's name is. Paul's name, it means least. He is the least one. And so he used to be called Saul, which was up here, Saul Destroyer. And then Paul, he changed his name to Paul, which was like the bottom of the barrel type of name. So he went from up here to down here. Um, <laughs> but, um, but that's that's just something to pay attention to. But it says a bond servant of God. So bond servant, as you guys might be aware about this, there's the bond servant is something that is a voluntary action. So if I owed you a debt during this time, I would work for you for like seven years until I paid off my debt for to, to you. So that's how I would pay it off because I didn't have enough money to pay it off. And so I would work for you and I would be your servant and I would do all these things, whatever you needed. And I would do it for a certain time. But a bond servant is somebody who is there doing it voluntarily when they don't need to do it anymore. So that's why Paul refers to himself.
himself as a bond servant time and time again. He's like, he's like, I, first off, I am the least and I am a voluntary servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so the apostle means one that is sent forth. We went, what was it? Uh, uh, I think it's first Samuel. Go to first Samuel. I think it's first Samuel. Uh, it's like 20. Um, 1 Samuel uh, 25. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, this is just a way to kind of get you into understanding the, the, the severity and how serious an apostle actually was. So in 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 5, it says, David, King David, David sent ten, 10 young men, and David said to the young men, go up to Carmel, go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, peace be to you, peace to your house, and peace to all that you have. Now I have heard that you were shearers, your shepherds were with us, and we did not hurt them, nor was there anything missing from them, all while they were in camel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you, therefore let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please do, please give whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son David. So when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all the words in the name of David. So in 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 5, at the end of verse 5, it says, in my name. And that's what I want you to kind of put like little brackets around. And then in verse, 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 9, at the end of verse 9, it says, in the name of David. So what I'm trying to get you to understand is that the one who was sent was held to the equivalent to the sender himself. So if I'm a king and I send a messenger to you and my messenger walks up and he's like, hey man, how you doing? Everything that that messenger said to you, he was representing the king. He was representing whoever he was coming from. Whoever sent him, it was as if the king himself was there. And that is how they took it during these times. And so when you see the word apostle, that is how these people were supposed to view Paul. That's how they were supposed to view all the other apostles. They were supposed to listen to them as if it was as if like he they were they were messengers of the king. That's crazy. Um, but it says Paul, a bond servant of God and the apostle of Jesus Christ, going back to Titus chapter one, according to the faith of God. God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth with accords with godliness. So here and it says the elect. Now, as Amber already ruined it, um, if you guys want to go to first Peter real fast, actually, um, yeah, go to first Peter chapter one, verse two, because this is a good one. Just talking about elect. We don't need to talk on it long, but it mentions elect in Titus chapter one. And so if you go to first Peter chapter one, verse two, and uh, yeah, no, Amber's in here. I'm just messing war, 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 um, Darum, war, um, Darum, war, um, Darum. Um, in first Peter chapter one, verse two, it says elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the father. So they are you and I, if you're a Christian, you're elect, but you're elect according to the foreknowledge that's so simple. Like, of course you are elect because God knows the end from the beginning because God cannot learn. He knows everything. So of course he, he's referring to us as elect because he knows, he knows who his own are. And it, that's what we need to understand. And so while we're here, let's go to second, uh, let's go to second Peter, second Peter chapter two, because this one, I like this one a lot in second Peter chapter two, um, second Peter chapter two, verse one, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, it says, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. So if you if you ever stumble upon somebody who's like, okay, you know, like a Calvinist, like there's five point Calvinists out there, there's four point, there's three point, there's two point, there's one point, whatever. It's not that big of a deal, but it's interesting how some people think that elect are only chosen, like, you, like you're going to come to Christ no matter what I do. That's just how they view it. But what we need to understand is that Christ bought everybody. He paid for everybody. It's on you and I to accept that gift. And that's what Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1 tells us, because it tells us 
that people are going to reject him, even though Jesus bought them. And though, so that's just, it's a complete rejection. It's not him rejecting us. It's us rejecting him. And that is hard. That is terrifying. What's up, Karen? How are you? Okay. So let's go back to Titus chapter one. So in Titus chapter one, verse one, it says, Paul, a bond servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect in the acknowledgement of the truth, which accords with godliness and hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before time began. Now, um, in chapter one here, there are going to be three things for Titus to do. Three things that Titus are, is going to be told to do. So Paul is writing to Titus. So Paul is writing to Titus, and there's going to be three things that Titus is going to have to focus on. In verse one through four, he's going to be told to preach God's word. He's going to be told in verse five through nine to ordain qualified leaders. And then in verse 10 through 16, he's going to have to silence the false teachers. And that's some heavy duty stuff that is put on Titus, but that is what Paul is writing to him for, in, at least in this first chapter. But in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, it says, In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. So promise before time began, um, you know, we've looked up some of these verses before, but if you guys want to go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, speaking of before time began, um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, it says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Sheesh! Like, what? I mean, this, this, like, okay, so when we did Ephesians chapter 1, like, which is up on YouTube, we spent, like, three and a half hours on chapter 1 here, in Ephesians chapter 1. We went all over the place because there were so many heavy topics. There was like 10 different topics that we had to talk about in Ephesians chapter one alone. And so it's important to just tr like, like it's one thing to read before the foundation of the world, but it's another thing to actually just sit there and think about it for a second. Let it sink in be like, wait a second. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Ah, if you didn't feel small before, Hopefully you do now, because what is that? Oh, man. Okay, so going back to Titus chapter 1. Sheesh! Well, hello, Amy. All right. So uh, what's up, Tammy? How are you? Okay, so it says, In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Verse 3, it says, um, it says in Titus chapter 1, verse 3, But has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God, our Savior. Okay, so preaching here in verse 3 has the idea of proclaiming or heralding. So whenever there's something that, you know, you're, you're shouting from the rooftops type of thing. Like, that's what these preachers are supposed to do. Preachers are there to preach the gospel, right? Preach the gospel, preach the gospel. Teachers are there not to preach the gospel necessarily, although it's good to incorporate it. They're there to talk and teach people who've already come to Christ. So preachers are for the lost. Teachers are for the uh, the, the the saints already, if you if, in a roundabout way. That's a very elementary, watered down type kind of way to remember, in a sense, the difference because of Ephesians. It talks about preachers and teachers, you know, some apostles, you know, whatever. Um, but at the end of verse three in Titus chapter one, verse three, it says, uh, to the commandment of God, our savior. Um, so the word savior here is going to be used six different times in this epistle. And it's interesting that it's used six times because savior, God, our savior. <laughs> and so this is everything. If you guys, um, I'm glad that you're here too, Karen. Um, God, our savior, what sinners need, what do, what do we need? We need a savior. And so if you weren't here for our study in Romans, Romans chapter one, Romans chapter two, and Romans chapter three are giving you the bad news. The bad news is that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You are a sinner. I am a sinner. And that, you know, like that's tough. That's hard to tell somebody. It's a difficult thing to go up to somebody and be like, you know what? <laughs> We're all a hot mess because there's some people who walk around like, they're better and they don't like they're trying to earn their salvation. And I talked to somebody like that, not too, like a, like three or four days ago. And I was like, ah, but Romans chapter one, two and three is all about giving you the bad news that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
But if you keep on reading in Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Man, that is so good. In order to appreciate the good news, you have to first understand the bad news. And so that's what the whole, like the book of Romans, you need to understand you need saving before you can get saved. Because if you don't think you're wrong or that you're lost, then how are you going to get saved? If you're out in the middle of the ocean just swimming around, you're like, oh, I could do this all day. And you think that you can just put your feet down and stand, not knowing that you're in the middle of the ocean and it's a thousand feet deep. And you're like, by the time you get tired, you're going to drown. And so a boat comes along. And he's like, hey, can I help you? And you're like, nope, I'm good. I'm just enjoying my time out here. That's the idea of what's going on here. You need to acknowledge that you're in you need saving. So it says uh, in verse in verse four, moving on, Titus chapter one, verse four, it says, um, it says to Titus, a true son in our com common faith. Now, in the uh, in the King James Version, verse four, it says to Titus, mine own son. So you have Paul. Hey, thanks, Monami. You have you have Paul in the King James Version. If you read this in the King James, it will say to Titus, my own son in the faith. And so this is where this is why some people believe that Paul actually won Titus to the Lord. And it's an interesting dynamic. I mean, maybe he did. And there's there maybe there's other information out there that can back that kind of idea up. But Paul refers to Titus as his own son. But here in my new King James, it says to Titus, a true son in our common faith. So anyways, there's a difference there in the in, in the understanding, but Paul might have led Titus to the Lord. And so it's kind of fun if that is true, because you're seeing the fruit of Paul's labor. Paul is living for the Lord in all kinds of out loud type of ways. And Titus is a fruit of that. And Titus will be hereafter. That's like, like if you have kids, they are your hereafter. They are like, however you raise them up to be, they are hereafter. And so Titus is going to be Paul's hereafter. But it says in verse four to Titus, a true son in our common faith. So focusing on common faith, if you guys want to go to Jude, um, go to go to the book of Jude. There's only one chapter. Go to Jude chapter three. I'm sorry, Jude, Jude, Jude verse three. There's only one chapter. Go to Jude verse three. Uh, focusing on common faith. In Jude 3, it talks, it says, uh, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, whenever we go through the book of Jude, it's probably going to take a lot longer than what you think it will, just because of how many different areas of approach. I think Leah was like, do the book of Jude. It's only one chapter. And we could we could stay there for a long time. So one chapter, challenge accepted. No, okay, I'm just messing. But going, so what I want you to focus on here is it says common faith, common faith, common faith, common faith. So it's mentioned there in Jude verse three, and it's mentioned here in Titus chapter one, verse four, because it says to Titus, a true son in our common faith. And so, hey, thank you, Wendy. Um, but in Titus chapter one, verse four, it continues on and it says, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our savior. Now, we talked about this before. Grace and peace is something that is very Pauline type of style. It's grace and peace, grace and peace, grace and peace. But here in these pastoral epistles, it's grace, mercy and peace, grace, mercy and peace. And it's important to understand this because I think it's so interesting because because pastors need mercy. It is unreal. I was my uh, my uh, my my parents, my parents came over for um dinner after sunday so which was easter and so my parents came over my dad's a pastor for those that don't know and i told my dad we were just discussing every time you put me and my dad in the same room like i just ask him all kinds of questions like i'm like hey what are your thoughts on this what do you think about this and i just we just it's all over the place and so it's funny because I just, I, 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 anyways, okay. So my dad's a pastor and I was telling him, I was like, Hey dad, trying to like lift him up a little bit. I was like, don't you think it's kind of cool how in these pastoral epistles, Paul inserts the word mercy there when he doesn't do that in all his other epistles, he's telling them that we need to meet your dad. He's telling us, he's telling you and I that these pastors need mercy. He's writing to Titus. Titus is a pastor. And so he's saying grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. We need to understand 
Like if you have a good pastor, let them know you're praying for them. Lift them up every single chance that you can. Take them out, call them up, be like, hey, can I take you out for lunch? Can I do this? I've been thinking about you. How can I pray for you? The pastors, the burden, you know, and I'm only talking about from my dad's point of view, just because I have that close, you know, insight. You guys need to lift your pastors up. It's tough battling and balancing and not giving in to how the world wants us to give into and doing all this type of stuff. I told my dad, I was like, it's easy for me because I don't see your guys' body language. I don't see how you sigh or shake your head. Like if you disagree with me, I don't read what you're doing when you're watching me. And so it's easy for me to say whatever I want to say, because I don't see you right here in front of me. If I was trying to tell you these things, when you're right in front of me, there's a lot of things that you'd be like, well, what do you mean? And no, I don't agree with that. And then you'd be like, "Mm -mm." and all these things. And so it's tough when you're in a room with other human beings who see things differently than you. And so they need mercy. And so pray for them, pray for them. So in Titus chapter one, verse four, it says grace, mercy, and peace from God, the father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our savior. So again, um, this is the salutation, but it says God, the father and Lord Jesus Christ. So you have two persons out of the three within the Trinity, God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit. They are three in persons, one in being. And so here you have God, the father and the Lord Jesus Christ in the same passage. So Paul is equating them or uh, putting them as equals, which we all know to be true. There are some people who don't believe in the Trinity. That's a conversation for a a different time. So going back to Titus chapter one, verse five, we are going to now be getting into um, the, the, uh, the, or like Titus, his instructions on ordaining qualified leaders within the church and their duties within the church. But in Titus chapter one, verse five, it says, for this reason, hey, thank you, Judy. It says, for this reason, I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So here it says set in order. He's setting it up, set in order. He's like, this is how the church order should be. And obviously it says that he's in Crete. We know we already talked about how he's in Crete. And uh, moving on to verse six, in Titus chapter one, verse six, it says, if a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordinate, or, or insubordination. Um, <laughs> insubordinate and churlish. Um, but it, it, it's interesting because Titus is a condensed version of First Timothy. So if you were here for First Timothy, then you probably already have an idea on the stuff that we're about to go over. But it says, if a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, one wife. Now there, now it's, it's so interesting. The husband of one wife. Now I've said it before when we went through first Timothy, specifically chapter two, because there's a lot of people who think women should be pastors. And I, you know, I put out a little TikTok video about, you know, the recap of first Timothy. And I use the analogy of puzzle pieces. Both puzzle pieces are of equal value. You have a guy, you have a girl, they are of equal value to complete the picture. And so if you try putting a piece where it doesn't belong, then the whole thing is going to look weird and it's not going to make the picture how it's supposed to be. And so we need to understand that my role as a man is different than a woman's role. And the woman's role as a woman is different than the man's role. And if you try to swap places like how the world is telling us to do that, then, you know, everything just kind of gets, gets, gets all crazy. Hey, thank you, Karen. Um, so you have, you have, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Women can teach. We talked about that too. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that here in Titus chapter two. They're supposed to admonish the younger, younger, uh, younger women, but you have, uh, it says having faithful children, not accused of dissipation. So in Titus chapter one, verse six, the word dissipation, uh, the idea behind that is riot. That's fascinating to me because you know, this, again, this is a condensed version of first Timothy chapter two, and it goes, you know, it, it, it expounds in first Timothy chapter two, but here women now, or the, the children who are dissipation, rioting, getting out of control, like, because if a, if a, if a pastor cannot control his own home, then that's emblematic of how he's going to run his church. 
And so that's why these rules are set in place. Paul is setting all of these things in place and be like, hey, if this guy's doing this right, this right, this right, this right, this right, yeah, then let him be a pastor. That's what you got to do. And so if he's not doing this or this or this or this, don't even give him a chance. And so it's it's he's giving us the instructions here on church order. So it's interesting that dissipation, riot, children not accused of rioting. That's crazy. Um, so... In verse 7, in, in Titus chapter 1, verse 7, it says, For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. Now, um, if you click on the word bishop in your Blue Letter Bible app, if you guys use Blue Letter Bible app, I told you this before in when we went through 1 Timothy, but if you click on elders or bishop, it is going to be masculine. It's going to be a masculine Greek word. It's masculine. And so th I, there's people who think different than what I'm saying that, oh, women can be the head of the church and stuff like that. I'm like, ah, you know, I don't say that at all. And I disagree. And so it's OK. You know, I uh, this I'm just telling you what I've concluded. And this is how I stand. And people will give you a different story. But I, it's just very, very fascinating to me. But it says for a bishop masculine must be blameless as a steward of God. Now, it, it's interesting that he uses the phrase here, steward of God. A steward does not own. A steward does not own things. Like if I'm in charge of a huge house that's not mine, I'm a steward of that house. And so I would be a manager of whatever, like that entire property. Like, oh, I'm, I'm the steward of this house. I, I need to take care of it. This is mine. This is my responsibility. So, it, so this bishop or the steward of God is somebody that manages everything that his master put in his hands or somebody you, you could refer to him as a fiduciary of sorts. A fiduciary is one who puts his master's needs before his own. And so here where it says as a steward of God, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. We've looked this passage up before, but what is the most important thing for a steward? What is if you are a steward of God, what is the most important characteristic that you can have? In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1, it says this, "Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God." Verse 2, "Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. And so if you are a steward in Christ, your most important thing that you need to be found is being faithful. Now you need to be faithful. And if you're faithful, then everything else is going to fall into place. If you have love, then everything else is going to be falling into place. Um, tell me why women cannot pastor again. I'm confused. Um, okay. Uh, if you go to Ephesians, if you go to Ephesians chapter five, verse 22, um, it says, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. So it's not, and I, and I don't, you know, Monami, I don't want you to be looking at this as like, it's like a diss because that's the way the world is trying to make it seem, but it's not you and I, if you know, a man and a woman are of the same value. And there's a lot of people who will are like, say like the world is trying to manipulate things. For example, we talked about, I used the example last time as communion, the Satan wants to get into anything he can to create division and be like, oh, I don't, I see it differently. I see it differently. I see it differently. So communion, for example, um, there, there was a, once upon a time, there was people who were blaming Christians as being cannibals because they talk about like, oh, you're eating the body of Christ and you're drinking the blood of Christ because that was all that was representation. Right. And so, so people were causing division within communion, something that is a beautiful thing. You probably don't see anything wrong with communion because there's nothing wrong with it. But there are people who have a problem with it. The same concept is true here in Ephesians 5.22. It says, wives, submit your own husbands as to the Lord. And so that's the key thing to circle and underline as to the Lord. Whatever you're doing, do it as to the Lord. And then it says in verse 23, it says, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And then it says, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church. So, so if you continue reading, we did this entire study. It's up on YouTube if you'd like to go through it uh, bit by bit. But there's essentially two rules. Women, let your men be in charge. Men, love your wives 
supremely. Like that's what we need to be doing. And so if you have a husband that is loving his wife supremely, then the wife is going to have no problem submitting. But the world that we live in right now, people get all mixed up and they get it all confused. And so now there's, there's, there's these beautiful ladies in the world who are like, oh, that man's got to earn my respect and earn, my husband's got to earn this. And he's got to, it's like, no, we need to be doing what's right before the Lord. And so when you, when you put up what you think, and then you compare to what God says, it's just like, how do we argue? And so, you know, I'm just telling you my, my two cents and you, you know, like I, I, I don't want, you know, I'm just, I'm just giving, I'm just giving you what I, where, where I've landed. So, um, hopefully that helps, but that's all in Ephesians chapter two. You can read more about it in first Timothy chapter two as well. I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter five, verse 22 to the end. And then, uh, first Timothy chapter two, probably like around, um, starting around verse 15 or so to the end of the chapter. So going back to Titus, um, so in going back to Titus chapter one, where are we? <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Titus chapter one. Okay. Um, so a fiduciary, we were talking about a fiduciary here in chapter one, but a fiduciary, we talked about how a fiduciary is somebody who puts their own needs or, or their master's needs above their own. So an, an example of that, let's go to Genesis 39. Um, Genesis chapter 39. Squirrel. Genesis chapter 39. If you go to Genesis chapter 39, verse 1. Let's go to Genesis 39, verse 1. In Genesis 39, verse 1, it says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Okay, and it goes on and talks about, you know, the, this this whole this whole lady getting all up in Joseph's business. Um, but we don't need to go there right now. But you have this picture of Joseph. And Joseph was bought. So Joseph was bought. He was a slave. He was bought by an Egyptian. And so I, I, I want you to, this is so, this parallels you and I right now, like in our, in our world, like so beautifully, Joseph was a slave. He was there wrongfully. He didn't do anything to deserve to be there. Right. And then all of a sudden he's, he's, he's bought. And then he has to, he's still doing what's right before the Lord, right? And so if you're a Christian, we are in a house. This world is not our own, but we're here. And so since we're here, we should be doing what's right before the Lord. And that's what Joseph was doing. Joseph, like this guy was blessed for Joseph's sake. And so if you're a Christian, when you go to work, like we, we owe our employer 60 minutes every hour, right? Like we're supposed to be working 60 minutes every, every hour. I mean... I mean, I mean, <laughs> I mean, we, I mean, after, you know, the smoke break, the coffee break, and then the lunch break, and then the bathroom break, and then all the other breaks, the break where I got to go outside and kick the tires. And then I wonder what, you know, the water break where you go in all the breaks, lots of breaks. Um, <laughs> it's just interesting to see Joseph was this guy, this Egyptian, this dude, this Egyptian was blessed because of Joseph. That's crazy. So imagine from this guy, from, from uh, Potiphar, imagine from Potiphar's point of view, he's looking at Joseph and he's like, my goodness. He's like, 
I'm going to let that guy be in charge of everything. It's, it's unbelievable. And so Joseph is a type of Christ. You can look that up. There's all kinds of different ways. It's really neat. It's really, really cool. Um, so Joseph was put in charge of everything. And so when you think about that, let's go to John chapter three. Um, let's go to John chapter three. In John chapter three, verse 27 is in John chapter three, verse 27. It says, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. Um, so you have Joseph being put in charge of this, everything, you know, it's all, it's all connected, but whatever you're put in plate in charge of whatever your, whatever your role is, whatever you're doing. And that's what Ephesians chapter five talks about, you know, husbands and wives. It talks about, um, uh, children and their parents. It talks about employees and employers, whatever, wherever you're at, do it as to the Lord. That's the phrase to focus on. Do it as to the Lord. If you're getting ill-treated over here, I let some, uh, there is somebody, I forget her name. Her name is Christ is King. I don't remember her actual name, but her, she made like a post and on the post that said, hey, you don't always need to say something back when somebody does something to you. And then it ended it by saying he saw too. Like he he saw it too. He saw what happened as well. And so I was like, man, that's, that's kind of cool. Just to remember, like, you know what, <laughs> he's, he's watching. And so it's, it's cool to see that type of stuff, but like, whatever you're doing, do it as to the Lord. And so here, when you go back to Titus chapter one, verse seven, it says for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. But this applies to bishops, bishops, you know, elders or overseers, whatever you want to say, pastors, preachers, it's, it applies to them, but it should apply. It applies to all of us. It, it should apply to all of us. We should, all of us as Christians should not be self-willed. We shouldn't be quick tempered. We should not be given to wine. We should not be violent. We should not be greedy for money, money, but we should be hospitable as verse eight says, hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober minded, just, holy, self-controlled. So here in verse eight, uh, it says hospitable of lover, what is good, sober minded, um, uh, sober minded has the idea of just being vigilant. You're being very aware of what's going on. You're being, you're taking it serious. The word just here has the idea of integrity, integrity. Like, I mean, you guys know people, like I'm sure you work with people where you just look at them and you're like, that person's going to do what's right. And they're not even a Christian. Like, that's crazy. Like there's some people who I used to work with that they would always be like, I got to go tell them I messed up. And they'd, they'd be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I, I'd be like the one, like, let's talk about this for a second. But here, integrity, it's interesting how some people just have like this wired inside their brains to just do things. And other people don't. And for some people, it's easy to do, but other people, it's hard to do. And it's just like, man, this is tough. But the word just here is, in, you know, indicative of integrity. And then it goes to holy. So holy in verse eight um, is has the idea of unstained or you're different from the lost. And so that's an interesting thing because there are pastors. I told you guys about this Bible study I went to and I was so excited. To, it was it happened like uh, I want to say it happened like probably like 10 years ago. And I went to this men's Bible study. I woke up on a Saturday morning. We would meet at like 630 in the morning. So I'd be there. And I was like excited because there was like three or four other dudes and then a pastor. So it was just like five or six guys. We'd have coffee. And I was so excited about the coffee because I was like, ah, and so, um, but it was fun. And so then once we were there, the pastor, the guy who was leading it, he was probably like 20 years older than all of us. And he was just saying words like swearing. And I was just like, anybody else? Anybody else? Want, am I the only one here? Anyways, my point, I told you about this. I think if you guys were here for those studies, I, I've mentioned this story before, but he was like swearing, you know, using those types of words. And I didn't even know this guy. And I'm just like, I don't know. you know, like, that's not what you think of when you see a pastor. And I'm not saying they're perfect. Absolutely. They're not. But he was swearing. And I was like, that's very strange. And like, that's not what I want to be a part of. And so then I, I left. And so my point is, is that if a pastor sets the standard down here, then the church is going to be right here. 
there's never a church that it, that goes above like the church is never above up all the way up here from where the pastor if the pastor's down here the church isn't up here the church is always right below wherever the pastor so if the pastor sets the standard up here then the church is going to be right here and if the pastor sets the standard down here then the church is going to be right here and so you need to find a pastor that is up here doing what is right and it's tough to do what's right and there are still good pastors who are still doing what is right but we need to be different from everybody else but let's go to first peter in first peter chapter 1 verse 16 talking about holy in first peter chapter 1 verse 16 it says be because it is written be holy for i am holy um but when you set yourself apart from everybody else like as far as being holy it, it, it go, let's go to second corinthians 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, hello Robin, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17, it says, therefore, 2 Corinthians 5 17, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. <laughs> when you become a Christian, you have become a new creation and it is amazing. We've talked about the difference between the sons of God, sons of man. We've talked about that a plenty of times, but we need to be different. We need to be set apart. We need to be, somebody needs to be able to look at you and be like, there's something different. That's just, that's just kind of, that's, that's, uh, that's what we need to do. So are you, are you doing that? All right. So let's go to Titus chapter one, verse nine. It says, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who are contradict or those who contradict. So the question in verse nine here is how do you encourage and convict? If you're going to encourage somebody and you're going to convict somebody, how do you do it? Well, you do it by sound doctrine. That's what verse nine is saying. It says in verse nine, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort, which means to encourage, both to encourage and to convict those who are, are those who contradict. So you need to do it by sound doctrine. Okay, but so sound doctrine, like what, what is sound doctrine? So sound, it's the difference between life and death spiritually. It is quite literally sound doctrine. If somebody is teaching a different gospel than what Paul's gospel is, then that is not sound doctrine. There are people out there who are adding water baptism to salvation. In order to get saved, you need to get water baptized as well. I disagree with that with everything. I believe that Christ paid it all and it is for by grace are you saved through faith. And so sound doctrine, if you go to a church where the pastor adds to what Jesus did on the cross or takes away from what he did on the cross, then you need to run. You need to run away from that. And so if they aren't right there, then they're going to, if they start wrong, they're going to end wrong. So that's why you need to start right so that you end right. And so that is, the, that's the idea of the sound doctrine here. But it goes to verse 10, Titus chapter one, verse 10, it says, for there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. So this is, um, this is interesting because remember what's going on here. Paul is writing to Titus. Paul is writing to Titus. Paul is a Hebrew of Hebrews. He is a Pharisee of Pharisees. He's a Jew. He, you can't get any more Jewish than what Paul is. But he says here, he says, for there are many insubordinate, both idol talkers and deceivers. And then he, he, he completely calls out his own people. He says, especially those of the circumcision, referring to the Jewish people, because the circumcision is talking about its representation of the Jewish people. So he's like, yeah, these people are these idol talkers, these insubordinate, these deceivers. They're all over the place, but they're especially within the Jewish world. And that's crazy. That's Paul's words. That's not mine. That's what he's saying. But that's interesting because he was a Jew. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Once upon a time, he was that person. He was that person who was ab abiding by the law, doing everything. But he was completely lost until he had that encounter with Jesus when he was riding to Damascus, which, you know, speaking of Damascus, you guys all know it just got hit. I mean, it's just crazy. Like the things that are happening here, you know, Damascus is going to get wiped off the face of the planet sooner or later. Uh, just be mindful of that. So who knows what's going to happen? Um, rapture imminent? It always has been and it still is. And I am looking forward to it. But going back to verse 10, it's been, it says uh, both idol talkers and deceivers. So these idol talkers, deceivers, these insubordinate people, 
Um, this is kind of goes back to what we talked about in Colossians, because in Colossians, we talked a lot about mysticism and Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, legalism and man-made traditions. And so you have these groups of people who were very, very around during that time, and they're still very around during our time. There are people who want to read you tarot cards. They want to give you crystals and say, ooh, and they got like a crystal ball and they're like, pick a card, any card type of stuff. And then you're like, you got to obey this law, this law, this law. And then you got to do the 10 commandments and you got to do all that. And then you'll be safe. And like, you're listening to all of these things and you're like, how do I determine what's real and what's not? It's like, well, I got to dive in and I got to dive in because I got to know it for me. And Acts chapter 17, verse 11 is a key verse for your life. It says for, uh, and these were more fair minded than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily daily, daily to find out whether these things are so you guys need to understand that what I don't believe me. I do not want you to believe me. I, I mean, I, I, I do because I feel like everything I'm saying is as accurate as I can possibly be, but you get my point. I, I, I want you to test all things. And so there are people who tell you the exact same thing in their lives, but it's going to be on you at the end of the day. We're going to stand before the Lord one day, the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat. And that's crazy because we're going to have to give an account, whether good, whether bad, as 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 tells us, it's wild. It's it's so important. We need to study to show ourselves approved. Now, it's not we're not supposed to take that verse and throw it at somebody else and be like, you're 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 dividing incorrectly. It's like, guys, you can say that all you want. We're not here to win arguments. We are here to win souls. And that's what we need to be doing. So let's get back to it. So in Titus chapter one, verse um, 11, in Titus chapter one, verse 11, it says, uh, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. Sheesh. Okay, so it says, whose mouths must be stopped. That's crazy. Whose mouths must be stopped. And then it says, who subvert. Now, the word subvert means to overthrow or to destroy. Now, if you remember, um, the churches back then, when the church was just beginning, primarily was taking place within homes. So the churches were primarily taken were, were taking place within the household. So if anybody had a house that could fit 10 to 15 people, we're having prayer meeting over your house. Hey, we're coming over. And then they would knock on the clay and then they would just let them in. But the, the houses would the, the churches would be inside people's homes. So in verse 11, it says whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, households. So if you focus about the households and you remember that the church was in the house, these people were destroying or overthrowing these many churches because they were weaseling their way in there. And that's just like that. Paul was warning Titus. He's like, he's like all of these unqualified leaders are mixing themselves into these households and they're overthrowing them. And that is not what we need to be. Do or that's obviously we need to be on, uh, on guard for that type of thing. But verse 11, where it says whole households, these were the small group churches of their times in a sense. Um, but then it says teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain there. I mean, <laughs> um, the dishonest gain, this is uh, monetarily speaking, like money, money, money wise. Um, people are very, very money motivated and it's heartbreaking to see because people want money so bad. They put everything above like money is above everything. What do we um, we just read it? Um, was it in Second Timothy? Um, you ever get like a time where, like where one ear just gets like really hot? Like this ear is just really hot, <laughs> right? <laughs> right now. But it says the, for the love of money is a root of all evil. So, you know, some people would say money is the root of all evil. No, that's not wrong. It's not wrong to have money, but it's the love of money is a root of all evil. It's very interesting. So if you, you know, obviously you need to discern and you need to test all things and feel them out. But these people were working for the sake of dishonest gain. Okay, so um, let's go to verse 12. And so in verse 12, Titus chapter 1, verse 12, it says, One of them, a prophet of their own, said, 
Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Okay, and so here in verse 12, Paul is actually quoting one of their own poets. So is Paul, so, okay, so Paul is writing to Titus. Titus is on the island of Crete, and he is quoting one of the Cretans' own poets. And so one of their own poets says in verse 12, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. That was one of their own, that was what they were known for. So there was a Greek word back during this time that was uh, Cretzin, Cretzin, K-R-E-T-I-Z-I-N, Cretzin, and um, that was slang. That was their kind of slang, you know, like how we would say Americans, you know, like, oh, Americans, like if you're over in Europe or something like that, Americans just look at us as if we're fat and lazy, right? Like, oh, Americans, they use Americans as a slang kind of word. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm not even going to argue with it anymore. We're just, we don't really do much. We're, we're just over here. We're, we got like, I just, I got, you know, it's just, I, I but here in, in the same kind of context of Cretans, this, their word was slang, which meant that every time they used this, it was, it was likening uh, the word uh, Cretan was uh, synonymous with the word liar. That's how they knew them. So this was synonymous with being liar. This was their reputation liars, evil, lazy. And so that's what Paul is quoting here in verse 12. This was quoting one of their own their, their own uh, poets. So in verse 12, with that in mind, it says, one of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. He was quoting one of their own. So, in, so after he makes that to be true, because it was a well-known thing about these people, this was, a rep, uh, uh, this was their reputation, he goes to verse 13. And so Paul, after setting the standard, he's like, after we all know this thing in verse 12, verse 13, he says, this testimony is true. Yeah, they are liars and evil beasts and lazy gluttons. He's like, this is testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. And so it's interesting that he is, Paul is telling Titus to rebuke these people who are liars and who are lazy and who are evil beasts. So let's go back to Jude. We were here earlier, but let's go back to Jude. Sheesh, are we under the law or not? No, we are not under the law. Jude chapter th chapter one, because there's only one chapter, but let's go to Jude. Um, and Jude, um, so in Jude, uh, verse three, where he says, rebuke them sharply. In Jude 3, it says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which once for all delivered to the saints. Contending. So Jude is predominantly about contending for the faith. And it's very difficult because there are people who want to challenge you and make you question, make you doubt. And so... It's a sense of arrogance. It's a sense of pride within those types of people. And they want to make you feel smaller than what you already are. Like as they want to take away whatever you have. They want to be like, I know more than you because of this, this, and this. What do you got to say about that? What do you want to say about this? And they want to argue all of these things, but we need to contend. The only way you can contend is if you are armed with the full armor of God, which is mentioned in Ephesians chapter six. And it tells us to be armed with the full armor of God two different times. But if you don't know the Bible, then you're not armed with the full armor of God. You need to know this because when you know this, then you can go out there and you can defend yourself. Uh, the sword is a defensive weapon and it's an offensive weapon. And so are you using it as an offensive weapon or are you using it as a defensive weapon? Do you even have a sword? Are you holding a spoon? It's like, I got a spoon. Are you kidding me? And so you got this whole like, you know, men in black thing where he, Will Smith gets like the cricket and then, you know, John Travolta has got this big bazooka type thing. And he says, OK, but um, going back to verse 13, it says this testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. And so um, as we go from verse 10 to the end of the chapter, this is talking about silencing, like silence false teachers. That's what he's that's what he's being admonished to do. So just kind of like a little bit of a review before we end here. Titus is told to do three things. He's told to preach the, the word. He's told to ordain qualified ministers and he's or, or leaders. And he's told to um, silence false teachers. That's a tough thing. I want you to actually 
imagine doing that. Silencing false teachers. That takes some buns of steel. <laughs> um, you know, I, you know what I was going to say. Okay. But it's, um, it's, it's just, it's just crazy. Like we read about this and we think, yeah, that makes sense. Why not do that? Like, yeah, of course he should do that. But what about when the time comes for when you need to do that? Like, wh- are you going to be able to stand up and are you able going to be able to be like, no, you're wrong. And like, you're wrong. And like, Hey, listen, like, you're like almost defending your friend at this point. Be like, Hey, don't listen to what he's saying. I will show you exact, like, can you defend it? Or are you just going to go along with it? Because they say the word Jesus every now and then, or they say the word Bible, or they say the word love, because those words are very, very deceiving when they're taken out of context. There are different Jesuses out there. There are different loves out there. There are different Bibles out there. And so you need to know this so that you can defend yourself. It's, it's an important thing to know. So in Titus chapter 1, um, Titus chapter 1, verse uh, 14, it says, Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. Now, this is obviously, we kind of touched on this earlier, but this is referring to about those legalism, um, mysticism mixed in there. They were mixing, you know, philosophy, Jewish tradition, man-made tradition, all putting it all in the same bowl, mixing it together. So that's kind of what this is referring to. Um, okay, verse 15. In verse 15, Titus chapter 1, verse 15, it says, To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. So this is an interesting verse because a lot of people will use this verse as a way to sin as much as they possibly want. This is this verse. This verse is taken so much, so much out of context. It's unbelievable. So Titus chapter one, verse 15, it says to the pure, all things are pure. So if you're saved, you can go ahead and do whatever you want to, because all things are pure. Right. Because that's what it's saying. No, don't. Nope, that's wrong. But it says, but but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are defiled. So let's go to Matthew chapter 15. And uh, it's good to know this kind of stuff because, you know, some people like to, some people like to live in sin without, with like, but lying to themselves. It's an interesting thing. And so what people do, and it hurts the rest of the body, if they are Christians, they label themselves as a Christian. They tell everybody I'm a Christian. They tell, they might even be a Christian, but then they go around and they live in sin. And I'm not one to be like, hey, you are saved or you're not saved. That's not my role. I don't need to be doing that. That's like, that's not my lane. I'm going to stay in my lane. But it hurts the body and it hurts the rest of the reputation of Christians when that Christian is living in sin, doing whatever they want to, because they're smearing the name of Christ. And so when you go to Matthew chapter 15, verse 10, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 10, uh, we'll read a handful of verses here. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 10, it says, When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then his disciples came to him. Do you know what the Pharisees were offended when they heard the saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into the ditch. Then Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulterers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So it's really interesting. So as you've heard me say time and time again, the uh, heart of the matter is always a matter of the heart, your heart posture. Where is your heart at? There's people who want to go 
do these things and they like they they rationalize why it's okay for them to live in such a way and so maybe it's a little bit of ignorance maybe it's just like them lying to themselves and they really know deep down inside that that, that it's wrong and that maybe they've even been told that they've been uh that it's wrong and they're still rejecting it and that you can't really do much for them other than pray but it's just it's just interesting to see how much and i can't fault them for any kind of reason because i know myself I am a sinner saved by grace and my flesh wants to just go jump in the nearest mud puddle. Like that's what it wants to do. It is a constant, it is a, it is a struggle and it is so tough and life is hard. And that's why we need to remember Romans chapter seven, because Paul in Romans chapter seven is law school. Romans chapter seven, Paul is talking and he is just like, he just starts venting. He's like, oh, this wretched man that I am. And he is just like, I'm a hot mess, guys. He's like, the things I want to do, I don't. The things I don't want to do, I do. And he's like, you can see this internal conflict within his mind. And he's just like, I'm being pulled both ways and it's tough and it's we're fighting an uphill battle, but we, we're going to win in the end. And so we know that, but we need to continue on and endure and so that we might win some. And so here, when you go back to Titus chapter Chapter one, where it says to the pure, all things pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are, uh, are defiled. So it's, uh, it's, it's just an interesting verse that people take out of context and they use it as a way to justify living in sin. So it's not, uh, it's not, it's not what we need to be doing. Titus chapter one, verse 16, it says they profess to know God, but in works, they deny him being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. So here in verse 16, it says they profess to know God, but in works they deny him being abominable. So abominable means it has the idea of being disgusting. You're disgusting. Being disgusting. Disobedient. The word disobedient in verse 16 means that they will not be persuaded. Hey, thanks, Mary Lou. Uh, So you have disgusting and they will not be persuaded. And then it has the word disqualified. So abominable, disobedient, and disqualified. So disqualified here in verse 16 has the idea of not able to pass to to uh, to pass the test. They are unfit, and that's the idea. That's the same word, uh, same word that's used uh, that Paul uses in First Corinthians chapter nine, where he says, "I don't want to be a castaway." This is that type of word. He does he, he doesn't want to be disqualified for every good work. So um, so that is verse 16. But Titus was told. Uh, was told not to be quiet. And it's interesting, just kind of doing like a little, like looking back on everything we just read in chapter one, he was told not to be quiet. That's interesting. He's not told to be quiet. He's told not to be quiet. He's told to exhort or encourage the people who are doing the things that are doing right. But then he's told to stop their mouths and rebuke them sharply when that time needed to come. That's crazy. He needed to manage the churches that are in Crete. And so can you imagine the amount of responsibility that was on him? I want you to imagine the stress, like this is stressful. Like you, I don't know if if, there there might be some managers in here. And if you're a manager and you have like 20 people under you and you're managing them and people are calling you at all hours of the day and they're asking you questions. Hey, is this okay? Is this okay? What do you think about this? Hey, what do I do? All of these things. And so Titus is in Crete. He's got a whole island he's in charge of. And he's just like, he he's got to he's got to navigate these waters and he, and Paul is telling him encourage the ones who need encourage rebuke the ones sharply who need rebuking and make sure you're doing it with sound doctrine those are some tough things but let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4 just a couple pages over so in 2 Timothy chapter 4 um 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2 this is the same kind of idea that Paul told Timothy. So remember, Titus and Ty- Timothy, they're kind of like they're 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 very they're, they're very closely related to uh, Paul. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Paul is telling Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. And so you see, it's a very, uh, second Timothy four, two, and everything that we just read in Titus chapter one, it's very closely associated to, um, to second Timothy. All right.
So if you guys are new here, thank you so much for being here. My name is Ryan. We're going to be going through Titus chapter 2, and then we're going to be going through Titus chapter 3. But if you guys are new, um, it's okay if you disagree with me on some of these some of these things. These A lot of these things are secondary issues. What I want you to know more than anything else is how to know for sure you can get to heaven. There's only one way, and that is by putting your faith in Christ and Christ alone. The, the Bible says uh, uh, for uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Right? It is for gr by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's not Christ and or Christ plus it is Christ alone. And so that is what I want you to know more than anything else. And if you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out to me here on TikTok. I would love to talk to you about it. But um, I put all of these uh, videos up on YouTube. If you are interested, there's a YouTube link up in my TikTok profile. If you wanted to go follow me over there, just in case TikTok bans me or bans TikTok all in, all in general, you can follow me. We can stay in touch on that kind of way. Um, but that would be cool. But we are going to, I'm going to put you guys on pause for about 20 seconds. And then we will dive right back into Titus chapter 2. And then we, we'll get into Titus chapter 2. We'll be talking about the blessed hope. Sheesh. I'll be right back. Give me 20 seconds. Two. And then we, we'll get into Titus chapter 2. We'll be talking about the blessed hope. Sheesh. I'll be right back. Give me 20 seconds. <laughs> okay. Can you guys hear me? Oh, man. Working hard to hang in there and need a lot of prayer. DJ Nick. Oh, man. Barb, I appreciate you hang, hanging in there. And you know that these will be up on YouTube if you need to go uh, pass out. I totally understand. I do not blame you if you do. It's good to see you guys. Uh, Barb and Tammy and you and DJ Nick and Jackie and Amanda and Amber and Monami and Jules and Gina. Sheesh. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. Um, I appreciate it. And Candy. Candy in the house. And I'm sure Chelsea's still here. I saw her make a couple comments. I appreciate the little the little, little comments here and there. Um, that is very, very cool of you. Chelsea's really cool, guys. You should go follow Chelsea. Okay, so let's go to Titus chapter. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Chelsea has quite a story of her own, but in, in, uh, Hey, thank you. We appreciate you. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Ren for sure. Um, okay. So let's go ahead and dive into cha Titus chapter two. So we're going to get into Titus chapter two, and this is going to be like more of a doctrinal, um, uh, a chapter. So doctrine, we're going to, we're going to be touching on some some stuff that is going to be uh, addressed towards the classes within the church. And then chapter three will be addressed towards the church members. So in Titus chapter two, um, it says Titus chapter two, verse one, it says, but as for you speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine it says, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Now it's interesting Let's go to Acts chapter 2, um, Acts chapter 2 real fast. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, uh, actually, Acts chapter 2, verse 41. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it says, Then those who gladly received his word, this is right after the Holy Spirit came down, this is right after Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, so in Acts chapter 1, Jesus ascends into heaven. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes down. And so they're figuring this whole thing out. It's a whole new dispensation, if for lack of a better term. I know some people are like, ooh, don't use the word dispensation. I honestly don't know how you dis dis describe it any other way. <laughs> like, it's very clear. And an easy way to kind of make people see that is like, hey, are we currently sacrificing any animals right now? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So what do you, how else would you describe it? Like we're clearly in a different thing. Um, so in Acts chapter two, verse, um, oh, wow. Anda, that's the, thank you. <laughs> so in Acts chapter two, verse 41, it says, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3000 souls were added to them. Verse 42, it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship. 
in the break, uh, breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now, it's interesting. So there's a lot here. But the one I, what I want to focus on is in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So it's really strange, right? So you have you have these 12 apostles. Well, 11, because, you know, they still... Oh, wait, no, they have Matthias at this point. So you have these 12 apostles. You have these 12 apostles, and then the Holy Spirit comes down. This was right at the Feast of uh, Weeks or Feast of Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit... So, okay, so so just to kind of paint you a picture, um, when the Holy Spirit came down, you have all of the Jewish people. There was a certain... There were certain feasts where all of the Jews were required by law to go to the temple physically, to be there in person. So there were some feasts where they could just observe it from home, but there were some where they were mandatory, like required to be at the temple. And the Feast of Weeks was one of them. Feast of Pentecost, Feast of Weeks, whatever you want to call it. And so they end up going to this temple and they're all in the same location. And while they're all there to observe the Feast of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes down and so I want you to imagine you have all of these people coming from all over the place, like all different tribes, nations, but they're all Jewish people. And they're all coming from around the area and they are all in this central place right around the temple. And so then the Holy Spirit comes down. And so you have people from all over the place and they witness the same thing. And so it's so fascinating to think about that that just occurred. And that's just so happens to be like when everybody was together, like, what are the odds? Like everybody was together. <laughs> it's crazy. So, but Acts chapter two, verse 42, it says, and they, all the people who got saved and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine. How can there be doctrine right so stinking fast? Like it just happened. Like, what do you mean? There's doctrine already. Like the church was just born. Now there's doctrine. Explain that one to me. But you have like, there was something that happened and these people had a supernatural something going on that w was applicable during, during these times because they were do doing these signs and wonders. And it says in verse 43, then fear came upon every soul. What? That's crazy. Fear came upon every soul. And it says that uh, uh, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. I'm saying this is unlike no other time. And so they had the this knowledge that was just instilled within them. And they were able to teach and tell and go and give that like the, 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 the marching orders to people. So this is the apostles doctrine. And so when you go back to Titus chapter two, verse one, it says, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. So sound doctrine, sound doctrine, sound doctrine. Paul is writing to T Titus. When Paul was writing to Timothy, I, again, you know, Paul is an older man. Timothy was a younger gen man. So you have the older generation handing it down to the younger generation. Same concept with Titus. Paul was the older man. He is handing it down, his information, his his authoritative teachings on the church order. He's handing it down to the younger generation, to Titus. So he's give, he had it. He gave it to Titus. Titus gave it to us. We have it all. The church has it. And so we have the same letter that they had back then. I want you to think about that, for example. You have the people during this time, back in 65 AD, were reading this because the church received it, or Titus received it, and it was supposed to be circulated throughout the area, right? You have manuscripts, right? Like that's manual scripts. They were handwriting it down, manuscript, manual script. And so there's a letter that they were reading. We are reading the exact same letter and so they knew what it was referring to. They knew how to operate. And it's so funny how 2,000 years later into the future, here we have the same letter that we're, that they read back then. And you look at what we know. And then you look at our church today. You look back at this. You look at the church. You look at this. You look at that church. You're like, one thing is not like the other. And I don't know which one's right. Is it the church that's right? Or is it this that's right? And it's just like, well, I'm going to go out on a limb here. And I'm going to say the Bible is right. So it's just fascinating. But it says, but um, it says, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. 
Sound doctrine. You know, churches get in a lot of trouble when they start doing little compromises. When churches start to compromise a little bit here and there and like, okay, well, okay, this over here or this over here, like you get into some dangerous waters. And so it's so important. Like I, I have such a, I'll, I have a lot of respect for people who are like, this is what we believe and this is where we stand and we can leave a little wiggle room over here. But on these issues, we're not moving away from this. And I, I, I think that's really, really important to have because it lets your people know where they stand. Like there's a lot of churches out there, for example, like, like there's a church that's like, what, 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 uh, there's like a rock city church. And I'm just like, if you drive past that and you see rock city, you're like, I don't know. What is that? Catholic? Is that, you know, is that Methodist? Is that Lutheran? Is that non-denominational? <laughs> like, what is it? But like, it's interesting because when you drive past a Baptist church, you're like, you kind of know what you're going to get when you go to a Baptist church, at least for the, you know, the independent Baptist churches. Um, same's true with, you know, Lutheran, like they, they have like, you know, it's just, it's just interesting, you know, but um, here it's uh I think it's funny when you go to uh, Titus chapter two, it says, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Can you imagine if America actually taught and upheld sound doctrine? Can you imagine what our world would look like if we actually were very outspoken behind the pulpits? I think, you know, we've talked about this before, but I think a lot of the problems that we're in in our world right now is because of the silent pulpits. People don't want to offend people and it's, and, and, and people get so offensive and like, it, you know, we live in a fallen world and everything's a hot mess. And so we were, you know, things are the way that they're going to be because, you know, this is all prophesied about, <laughs> like we can't stop the thing that's coming, but it's, um, it's, it's amazing to imagine what life would be like if we actually adhered to the scripture. But, uh, you know, um, uh, the church used to be the, the navigational system for America and now, now it's not. Now America has no navigational system, and it is terrifying. Um, it's it's really heartbreaking. There are still some good churches out there, but it is it's it's a it's a it's a minority in a big kind of way. So hey, thank you, Candy. Um, so let's go to um, Titus chapter two, verse one. It says, "But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine." That the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, and love and patience. So here in verse 2, it says that the older men, and I want you to understand that first he's going to address the older men, but in verse 3, he's going to address the older women. So you have like this kind of system that he's going to follow. He's going to talk about the older men first, and then in verse 3, he's going to talk about the older women. So older men first, older women second. So in verse 2, it says that the older men be sober. Now, the word sober here has the idea of being vigilant, being very serious about like their operation like if, or their, their, um, their, their profession. It, it's funny. There are people who don't take their profession very serious, right? And then there are people who take their profession very serious. So here, he wants these older men to be sober, be vigilant. You know, you're, you know, first Peter, uh, five, uh, five, nine, um, be sober to be very serious about how there's to work within the church. They want to be very, very serious, be sober, be serious. Reverent has the idea of being respected. They should be, these people that are working within the church need to be respected. Um, but in first, uh, going back a little bit in chapter two, verse one, it says, but as for you now, who is you? This is Paul talking to Titus. So Paul is saying, but as for you, Titus, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. So again, remember, Paul is talking to Titus and he's informing him on how to think. So in verse two, he says that older men be sober or serious, reverent or respected, temperate, sound in faith in love, in patience. Now, I, I feel like I don't need to explain those. Those are very simple. But in verse three, it says the older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. So you have the older men in verse two, you have the older women in verse three. And it's interesting in verse three, we talked about this before, but it says not slanderers, not slanderers. The word slanderers there is diabolos. It's a uh, diabolos or something. Diab diabolos, diabolos. And that is one of, uh, you know, that's, it, it means accuser. And that's one of Satan's 
titles. He is the, the accuser of the brethren. So that's what slanderer is, accusing, accusing. So it says, uh, the older woman, uh, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teacher of good things. Now, we've talked about wine before, and there's there's two camps. You're either completely against it or you think a little bit is okay. And I always use, like, if you're not sure, if you're on the fence, if you're teetering or tottering on like, hey, is it right or not right? If you're struggling with it, then it's wrong. If you're struggling with it, it's 100% wrong. Don't do it. And so what is interesting for the people who choose to drink, you know, because like, you know, every to each their own. But I use the analogy, if I am 100% sober right now, I have my defense up. I'm like completely ready to go, take on the world, right? If I have one drink, I'm lowering my defenses. And now you can see me. I'm like Wilson from uh, Tim Allen, whatever, the Home Improvement Show. I'm like, hey, man, you know, like, and so now you can see my eyes. I'm like, I'm exposed. And so then you go down a little bit more once you have another drink and then your whole head show and then three drinks, you're down here and you're like, ah, and so that's how you need to look at it from a spiritual kind of sense, right? Because we are um, like, I mean, if you're being honest with yourself, the more you have, the more you're going to be vulnerable to thinking things that you typically would be able to defend. And so it is, it is interesting here. And so that's just my two cents on it, but it says not given to much wine teachers of good things. So it tells teachers of good things. Women can be teachers, but it expounds on that in verse four. It says that they admonish, admonish means teach. So in verse four, it could say that they teach the young women to love their husbands, to love their children. And so this is an interesting verse. Because, you know, I, I was going to assume that the word love here in the in this passage was agape, because that's kind of been the, the theme throughout the past couple epistles we've read. Every time we stumbled upon a, a love, it's always been agape. Here, it's not agape. Here, it, so here are these are two separate words, but they're both derived from the, 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 the word phileo. So there's two words for love. There's agape and there's phileo. So here... It's in verse four, it says that they admonish the young woman to, uh, it, it's like, a, it's like a weird, it's like they're two words, but they're both derived from uh, phileo. So be fond of. So it has the idea of liking, being fond of their husbands to be fond and to like their children. That's crazy. That's very surprising for me to learn that to like them. And it's also important to understand that in verse four, that husbands are mentioned first. It's not children. It is husbands. Now, this is really important to understand because, okay, so from a, um, I want you to view what we're talking about here from a child's point of view. Imagine if the children or the child was put first and then that child grows up and then they marry uh, their, you know, husband or wife or whatever, and then they have kids and then they completely put their spouse on the back burner and then they put everything, the child first. That's not how it's supposed to be here. The husband is first for the woman's point of view. The woman needs to put her husband first. Just, you know, Ephesians chapter five, we talked about Ephesians 5.22. And um, it's interesting, the order that we're given. We The woman needs to put her husband first and then her children. And then in verse, it says that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children. That's what the older women's roles are to be because they're supposed to hand down what they've learned. Now, those older women didn't really come to that perspective until they got to that age, some of them. Some of them were doing it all the way, all the way up until they were older and they knew it all the way all, all, all along. But everybody has different upbringings, but things come across differently from an older point of view. And so if an older person comes up to you and tries to teach you something, a younger person will be more willing to listen rather than if a young person is up there talking, right? And so same concept. If you go to church and you see somebody who's like 21 years old, you're going to be like, and, uh, but if you see somebody up there with like a hoary head, like, you know, like, uh, all gray hair and all this type of stuff, like you're going to be looking at them and you're going to be like, okay, you, like, I can look up to you. Like you've got some experience. You've been there, done that. You've been around the block, all that type of thing. But here it says that they teach the young women to love their husbands first, to love their children. So husbands first, children second. And so if you love your husband first, think about what kind of model you are setting for the children. If you love your husband first, you're living the example for the child to watch. You are this amazing example for the children. And so then if the mom is doing what's right and the 
dad is doing what's right, then the children will look for what is right when the time comes, when they grow up. But it's it says to verse five in second in Titus chapter two, verse five, and in, in Second Timothy chapter, oh, I'm sorry, in Titus two, verse five, it says, uh, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Okay. I if you haven't followed me on YouTube yet, you should probably go do that because I might get banned. Um, we're about to get weird. Okay, so here's an interesting concept. In verse 5, it says that the home is... Uh, so So to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Okay, so the idea here is that the home is the their ministry. The home is the woman's ministry. And that is nothing, that is, that is arguable, that is, <laughs> okay, you have an American narrative that is being pushed out that says that what I just said is complete BS, right? Like, that's terrible, like, that's not right, it's terrible, like, I can't believe you would say such a thing that the women's place is in the kitchen, oh my goodness, like, all the stereotypes, right, that go along with it. No, the home is a ministry. But that's not how the world wants you to look at it. The world wants you to look at it as you're not enough if you're a woman. The world wants you to look at like the man's way up here and the woman's all the way down here and how could you and all this type of stuff. But if you look at it from the biblical perspective, the home is the, the ministry of the woman. And that is great. That is so important. Like that is so huge. And like if you look at it like the home is the ministry, like now all of a sudden you're like, I got a whole new lens on this entire thing. And now I can like look at this and be like, I need to live and do this for my husband as to the Lord. And I need to do this so that my children see me do that as to the Lord. And I got to I got to do this and this and this and whatever it is. And it's nothing like it, it's nothing. It's it, it, it it's it's funny how we view things, right? Like you guys might look at me as like, oh, Ryan's telling people all about Jesus and like, oh, he's doing teaching and all this. Oh, Ryan's so cool. And like, I know you guys, I know you want me to sign your baby. No, totally kidding. I'm totally kidding. You know, that's not my heart at all. But like it, the per per perception is there. Like, I want you to understand that a woman doing those things at home is so valuable. It is so valuable. It's probably more than, you know, like the things I'm doing, because women are raising up the generations. They're raising up these children who are going to be doing and carrying on the torch. They're going to be running around and like, you know, we pass the baton off to them. And so if you raise your children right, then they will be able to carry on and defend the faith and contend for the faith. And that's what we need to be doing. But it starts at home. And so that's why our world is a mess, because they've broken apart the nuclear family. And they want this division between the man and the woman when it's supposed to be this beautiful thing. And this, you know, like, wait until marriage, you know, having sex before marriage, all this type of stuff, like, oh, that's so old school, I can't, I'm not going to do that. It's like, no, that's what it's supposed to be. But like, nobody wants to do it anymore. And so like, when you listen, when we listen to what God tells us to do, like, it is a beautiful, thriving relationship. And God finds so much joy and pleasure in it. And so when we do it, it is amazing, but we're not doing it. And so then there's this all kinds of contention and division within the home. And then the man is looking at the woman, the woman's looking at the man, and they're like, like all barking at each other all the time and it's wrong. But if a man knows his place, if a woman knows his place and they come together, that's why it's important to be equally yoked. If you get into a relationship where the woman sees or has a different spiritual outlook than the man and the man's a believer, but the woman's not, or the woman's a believer, but the man's not, then you're going to, you're going to have uneven kind of like when they, when you guys fight, the man's going to fall down on rocky ground. The woman's going to fall down on Christ because that's her foundation or vice versa. You need to be equally yoked, but you need to chase Christ first, find him, put you put him first in your life. And when you put him first in your life, everything else will, will make sense and you'll be okay with it. But if you're, if, if you're not chasing after Christ, if he's not your number one, it is Christ first, other second, and I'm third. If that's not your mantra, as you go about your day-to-day -day life, then you need to work on it. And it's not too late, but I don't want you to, 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 to make it. I don't want you to minimize the absolute beauty that is within a woman making her home a ministry. Like, don't look at other people and compare what you're doing to them because that's not what we're supposed to be doing. We're not, <laughs> we're like, we're supposed to stay in our lane and do what we're called to do. And this is the type of stuff, like, this is how we know what we're supposed to do. And so I, I don't, I don't, okay. <sighs> okay. So 
in uh, Timothy, uh, Titus, here we go. So in Titus chapter two, verse five, it says to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. That's not a very popular thing to say in our day to day life, but that's that's, you know, it says it. So I believe it. But what I want you to think about here and what I want you to consider is in verse five is does this mean when a woman is okay so when a woman is discreet when a woman is chaste when when a woman is a homemaker when a woman is good when a woman is obedient to their own husbands when a woman does those things it says that the word of god will not be blasphemed right that's what it says so let's go ahead and flip the, the script and so let's flip it again. Let's flip it. It said, so what, what, what happens if a woman does not do that? So if a woman is not discreet, if a woman is not chaste, if a woman is not a homemaker, if she is not good, if she is not obedient to her husbands, then she blasphemes. That is a big oof. That is a big oof kind of statement. Blaspheme. Blaspheme is uh, basically imputing evil to God's name in any kind of fashion, no matter what. Like, it's not just, you know, taking the Lord's name in vain. It is imputing evil to his name. Now, we need to understand his name is, his name, his name is wonderful. Counselor, Prince of Peace. Like, we have these names for Christ, right? We have these names for him. And it is nothing but pure, it is nothing but holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Why is it holy, holy, holy? Why is it three times? God the Father, holy. God the Son, holy. God the Holy Spirit, holy. Holy, holy, holy. All three of them. But you, it's unbelievable. So when you attach anything un, that is not good to his name, then you are blaspheming. And that's kind of what this is implying. Ah! So, okay. So that's, I'm just saying if it works one way, then if you rotate it around or you flip it around and you look at from the inverse, it's just like, man, that's crazy. And again, it's important to understand because you and I look at things in our life and we look at our sin because we all have sin in our own lives. And we like to look at our sin as if it's not that bad, right? It's not that big of a deal. And that is the most incorrect thing to ever think. It is so wrong because you need to understand that. Remember, Eve took a bite of an apple and she received the death penalty. That is, that's crazy. That is what she deserved because she disobeyed God. That is how, that is not how severe and terrible God is. That is how holy God is. He can't be around even a little disobedient time where she takes a bite. Wow. And so when you think about that and you look about how he, how serious he takes the relationship within the home and how beautiful it is, if we're both doing what we should be doing, he loves that. But if you flip it around and if we're not doing what we should be doing, wow, it is a big deal. And it's so funny how good Hollywood is because Hollywood makes it seem that it's okay. Hollywood makes it seem like, I don't know if you remember the trend of like television, but like you probably do, but like it used to be once upon a time, like where they wouldn't say like any cuss words on TV, like it wouldn't be anywhere. And then they would sneak one in there. And I remember hearing one when I was little and I'd be like, oh. you know, like, and then my dad got like this whole TV guardian type thing. And then every time somebody swore it, like would edit it out and it would be like silent. And we'd be like, man, I can't watch anything because the whole, it's like a silent film. But my point here is it, it, you, it, it once upon a time was none of that. And now all of a sudden it is anything and everything and they're allowing it all. And even like what's going on within relationships, they're like, um, they're normalizing people sleeping together as if it's like a com complete, like they're getting people used to the idea of sex before marriage. And when they do that, then the man's going to be like, why do I even need to marry this woman? Cause I, why buy the cow when the milk is free type of thing. And it's just like all this whole wrong way of thinking. And then people aren't getting married until much further along. And then, they, then they want kids, but it's too late. And then the, all of these types of, it's just, it's just, it's, you can see, remember who the God of this world is. It, the prince of the power of the air is Satan. And he, like, you can tell it is very apparent if you look around the world right now that we live in a fallen world. It doesn't take a genius to take, to understand that. But when you see it, you can't unsee it. Okay. So let's go back to Titus chapter two In Titus chapter two, verse six, it says, likewise, exhort the young men to be sober minded. 
So again, just to kind of regroup, it says, uh, this is Paul talking to Titus. Paul is telling Titus to encourage the young men to be sober-minded. Man, that's a short verse, but um, Paul is informing Titus, and Titus, you know, like the head of all the churches here in Crete, he is telling them as a pastor, exhort the young men, encourage the young men to be sober-minded. You know, Oh, man, our generation. (laughs) Okay. Okay, Titus chapter 2, verse 7. It says, in Titus chapter 2, verse 7, it says, In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility. What's fascinating about this verse is to remember that Paul is telling Timothy. Paul is telling Timothy, in verse 7, Hey, Timothy, in all things, showing integrity yourself. He is telling Timothy to be an example. Be an example, Timothy. Tell them how. Don't you, don't only tell them how, but show them. You're, you can talk the talk and you can walk the walk, but your walk talks so much louder than your talk talks. Your actions speak so much louder than your words. And so that's what he's essentially telling him here. He's like, in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility. Verse eight, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. That is crazy. (laughs) Because, you know, when you start getting into an argument and you start winning the argument, then things start getting personal from the other end and they just start throwing personal attacks at you. Well, basically, if they don't have anything bad to say about you, that's kind of the goal here to basically not give them any ammo. Don't lay don't leave any ammo laying around. And so if you're able to do that, then uh, it's only going to benefit you in the end because people are going to start trying to throw personal attacks at you. You look at the media right now and if you run for any kind of political office, it's just basically like all hands on deck. We're going to just wreck this person who is, you know, a Christian. We're going to try to slime his name in any kind of possibility or any kind of possible way. But in Titus chapter two, verse nine, it says, exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back. So uh, ex- uh, exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters. Now here's this word bond servant again. The word bond servant has the idea of a voluntary decision based on that individual. Meaning if I paid off my debt that I owed to you, I could voluntarily stay with you if you would allow me, right? Like, hey, I love you and I love your family. Can I stay here? I'll, I'll work for you, whatever you need. Like, just am I allowed? Keep me on your staff. Like, whatever you want me to do, I will do it. And so that's the kind of the idea here of Paul refers to himself as a bondservant in Titus chapter 1, verse 1, and many other places. But here in Titus chapter 2, verse 9, it says, exhort bondservants to be obedient to their own masters. So they are there voluntarily. Um, But remember, obedient to their own masters, a lot of people get lost in the whole slavery, slaves, servants type kind of conversation. This was just the way, you know, their economy at their time. And so I think it's important to look at it from an employer employee type of standpoint, because you and I in our world today, we're we're slaves in our own kind of way. Right. Like you look at (laughs) like we're wage slaves, like we have to work so that we can live. Right. And so like we're slaves in a modern kind of way. And it's just a, you know, perspective. But in verse nine, it says, exhort bond servants to be obedient to their masters. Now, obedient to their masters. If you go to Ephesians chapter five and you read after the whole, you know, wives submit to your husbands and then it goes down to children, obey your parents. It goes to uh, it goes to the next one where it's uh, employers and employees type of relationship. So here, remember the key phrase, no matter what category you're in, whether it's husbands and wives, whether it's parents and children or employers and employees, think about the key phrase, which is as to the Lord, as to the Lord, whatever you're doing, do it as to the Lord. And so that is what we need to remember. So do it as to the Lord verse. um, Well, okay. So it says exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back. You know, it's interesting. Um, Well, let's go to verse 10. In verse 10, it says, um, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity. 
that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. So here in verse 10, it says not pilfering. The word pilfering has the idea of stealing. So not stealing, but showing all good fidelity. Now the word fidelity has the idea of conviction. So it could say not stealing, but showing all good conviction that they may adorn. Adorn means to honor or to prepare. Um, that they may honor or prepare the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. So it's interesting in thinking about, you know, the relationship that we have. Like here, he's talking about bond servants and their masters. And, you know, you and I, in in this regard, it's it's interesting to think about how, what's our relationship with the people in our life? So, you know, you guys remember um, how... It says when, uh, what is it, in Matthew, it talks about how if somebody compels you to carry his tunic for one mile, carry it for him two miles. Do you guys remember that? Well, that was like a Roman law. A Roman soldier could tell you to carry his equipment for one mile. Like that was their law. And so you could, like, if it happened to you, you would carry it and you'd be like, oh man, this is terrible. So the, the, Jesus, Jesus told them to carry it for two miles. Now, why did he tell them to carry it for two miles? The reason why he told him them to carry it for two miles is because the second mile is when you were actually winning them. That's when your testimony was being made because, you know, in the same kind of concept goes along with tithe because people think I just need to give 10%. And, you know, it's good to do that. Like, it's not about how much you give. It's about the posture of your heart when you actually do give tithe. Because people are like, I don't want to give money. I don't want to do it. I want to hold on to my money as much as I possibly can. But it's, it's, it's the heart of the matter. It's your posture of your heart within you. God loves a hilarious giver is what the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians. But what I want you to understand is that when you think about that man carrying that Roman soldier's gear for one mile, he's, he has to do it. So there's nothing that's actually being gained there. But when you continue on for the second mile, that's when you get to win them. That's when you get to show them. That's when you're, you're, you're not only talking it, you're, you're walking it, you're, you're, you're showing it, you're being that example. And so the same concept is true with, uh, with tithing in a sense, because 10% is what we're told to do, but it's not until after 10% to where you're like, actually like, oh man, <laughs> oh, like, because we're told 10%, right? But when you think about, like, when you start giving a little bit more, you're like, that's where you're actually giving. And so that's an interesting concept. When you walk one mile, it's because you have to. But when you walk two, it's like, man, now I'm doing it for another reason. It's a whole different thing. And so so you're asking for money. I am, yes, give me all your money, hothead Jill. I love it. No, I don't. No, that's not at all what I'm asking. I, I, I no, not at all. I'm just, okay. Um not at all. Okay, so let's get back to Titus chapter 2. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Okay, so this 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 is so neat. Okay, so we're, we're so in verse 11, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So if you were here for a study of Romans, you know what the acronym GRACE stands for. Grace, G-R-A-C-E, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. So it says in verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation. Okay, so we're going to talk about, you know, salvation. There's different tenses of salvation, right? So there's past tense, there's present tense, and there's future tense. What I mean by that is when you gave your life to Christ, if you ever accepted Christ as your personal savior, what, what, let's say you, you did that 10 years ago. That was when you were justified. That's past tense. So you, that was past tense, justification. Justification means to be declared righteous. Then in our day-to-day, -day, right now, moment by moment here in today, whatever day it is, now we are currently being sanctified. It is a present tense type of thing. Thank you, Monami. It is a present tense type of thing. So that's sanctification. When we get home with the Lord, then we will be glorified. So past tense, justified, present tense, sanctified, future tense, glorified. The same thing, you're going to see the same kind of uh, dynamic here in these next couple verses, verse 11, 12, and 13. You're going to see the past tense, present tense, and future tense, but of grace. For example, in verse 11, it says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, meaning that's past tense. It has appeared to all men, right? It's, it has to. But in verse 12, it says, teaching us 
which is present tense. Currently, this is teaching us is current present tense, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Then verse 13 is the future tense, looking for the blessed hope. So you have the past tense in verse 11, you have the present tense in verse 12, and you have the future tense in verse 13. So the same is true with salvation, justification, past tense, sanctification, present tense, glorification, future tense. Same thing is true with the grace aspect here, because the grace has appeared to all men in verse 11, teaching us, verse 12, blessed hope, future tense. So it says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Are you doing those things? Is there some sin you're just letting linger around just because you feel like it's not that big of a deal or you're doing better than somebody else? Man, I'm telling you what, the more I'm diving in this book, the more I am getting worked on. It is unbelievable. But in verse 13, it says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, that is unreal. Um, our blessed hope. Our blessed hope, future, this is referring to the rapture. Now, there's a difference between the rapture and the second coming. Now, when we, we went through this, when we went through the book of Revelation, but there's a difference between the rapture and the second coming. So I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. If you disagree, that's that's fine. Like, it's nothing to create a division over. We need to, as long as as long as we believe in the gospel, which can be found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, then you're doing well. But this is a secondary issue, and I'm going to tell you what I believe. I believe that there's going to be something called a pre-tribulation rapture. The pre-tribulation rapture, or harpazo, is where it is this, this seizing away or snatching away by force. You have examples of it in uh, Genesis. Enoch, for example, Enoch walked with God, and then he was not. So he was there. And then he was not. And so you see that like there's a little individual rapture right there. And then you see it again. Elijah was taken up by chariots of fire. He was there and then he was not. And then you have um, Philip in the book of Acts. Philip was with the Ethiopian eunuch. He was there after he led that Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord. He baptized the Ethiopian. And then right after he baptized the Ethiopian, Philip was harpazoed. He was taken away and he was put into a different city. I'm just like, that's crazy. And so this is not a new topic. People say, oh, that's new. It didn't happen until Moody and like the 1800s and all this kind of stuff. No, if you study First and Second Thessalonians, you know that the Thessalonica church was hyper aware about the second coming, about, the, about this glorious appearing because they thought they missed it because they thought they were in the day of the Lord. And so Paul has to write them the second letter to the Thessalonica church explaining and basically talking them off a ledge saying, no, you didn't miss it because you're children of the day. You're not children of the night. It's this whole concept. But you have in verse uh, 13, it says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So there's a difference between the rapture and there's a difference between the second coming. So the rapture is when, you know, in First Thessalonians chapter 5, it says we will be caught up with him in the air. It specifically tells us that we will be in the air. So, so that's, that's up in the air, but then the second coming is when we come back with him at the end of the tribulation during the battle of Armageddon. And that is not until after the seven years, which is, you know, the time of Jacob's trouble, you know, the Daniel 70th week, whatever you want to call it. It's uh, the, so the order of operations is rapture the way I see it. The, what, the order of operations is rapture is next on the prophetic timeline. I believe the rapture could occur at any moment. And I, I, it's imminent. Like this is our blessed hope. Like, you know, that crown that who um, Sheena was asking about the other day uh, or, or just a couple hours ago, it says in second Timothy chapter four, verse eight, it says, finally, there's a laid up for me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who love his appearing. So, you know, you can apply that to this verse if you would like to, but you know, people see it differently, but it's just interesting. You have the raptures next, Right after the rapture, so shortly thereafter, the tribulation is going to begin. There's going to be seven years of tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, the second coming, we're going to come back with Christ to the ground. And it's crazy. Like, we're going to be there with them. And he's going to just speak a word, and they're just going to dissolve. There's going to be blood up to the horses' bridles. Like, all of these things that's happening over in Megiddo, over in Jerusalem. Like, it's like, what? I mean, all the battles that took place over there 
over history. It's unbelievable the history in that place. But like that's where it's all going to culminate right there. And here we are. Just anyways, I am uh, optimistic about a blessed hope. Like if like I don't know, I don't know. You know, okay, we don't need to. I, I, we don't need to stay too long on that. But I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Okay, so let's go to Second Timothy chapter two, verse um, fourteen. In Second Timothy chapter two, verse fourteen, it says, "Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works." Okay. Well, it's interesting in verse 14, it says, who gave himself for us. Now, this is very, um, if you guys remember Genesis chapter 22, um, let's go to Genesis chapter 22. Because in Genesis chapter 22, you have something that is referred to as the Akedah, just kind of like similar in Philippians chapter 2, you have something called the Kenosis. This is called the Akedah. And this is where you have this whole, this whole, uh, rehearsal of what was going to happen 2000 years in the future, essentially when Jesus was going to die, God, the father was going to give his son to die here in Genesis 22, you have Abraham and he is going to sacrifice his own son. And that's the, you know, this is paralleling what Jesus was going to do on the cross. It's very, it's kind of, it, it parallels that. But what I want to focus here on Genesis chapter 22, verse eight it says in Genesis chapter 22, verse 8, it says, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a off- burnt offering. So the two of them went together. So you have this whole story where Abraham and Isaac are walking in agreement. Like, it's important to understand, Isaac was not tied up. Like, I mean, like, like being forced, like by like, like uh, the tip of a spear. Like, no, they were walking in agreement, like in one accord, understanding um, now in verse nine, it does tell us that he was bound, but he, they, like, he didn't force him to go up there. So I need you to understand the difference. So Abraham and I, Isaac were walking together, knowing what was going to happen. And then once they got there, then Abraham bound him. Now, obviously we know that Jesus was bound as well, even though that was against the law during that time, because you cannot bind a prisoner unless he is first guilty and all these other things. Like, like there's no violent crimes or anything like that. So it's just very, it's very, uh, this, this whole situation parallels everything that Jesus went through. But what I want you to focus on in Genesis chapter 22, verse eight, is that it says, and Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself. Now, if you go back to Titus chapter two, verse um, 14, it says, who gave himself for us. Now, it's just so interesting. God gave himself. Abraham said to Isaac, his son, God will provide himself. Now, Abraham was basically prophesying what was going to happen. And I just, I think Abraham knew what he was acting out. Like, I, I, you know, it's not important, you know, like you can disagree. It's not that big of a deal, but it's just interesting to imagine because Abraham, his whole thought process was like, Hey, Abraham, if I'm Abraham, I'm thinking, Hey, God already promised that he is going to um, like uh, there's going to be generations and generations and generations are going to happen because of Isaac. So Abraham, in Abraham's mind, he, Abraham's like thinking, if God wants me to kill Abraham, I don't have a problem. God has a problem. So he's like, he, he's like, God's not going to break his promise. He's like, if I kill him, he like Abraham probably thought that he was going to have to kill him. And then Jesus or God would resurrect him. That's probably what he thought, but God stopped him. And it's just, it was the whole it's the whole picture. It's just really neat. Anyways, going back to uh, t- Titus chapter two, verse 14, it says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us. Now, redeem means purchase, purchase, like he bought us, right? You know, um, that goes back to second Peter chapter two, verse one. If you guys remember that, um, we can turn there in case you're, you, you're, you didn't, you weren't here for it. But in second Peter chapter two, in second Peter chapter two, Second Peter chapter two, verse one, it says, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves with destruction. So you have Jesus. He paid it all. It is finished. Testelestai, right? Like he, it is done. And so it's interesting when you think about what he did, he paid it all for everybody. There's just people who accept it, and then those who don't. 
So here in verse 14, Titus chapter 2, verse 14, it says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify. Now, the word purify, purify has the idea of sanctify. Sanctify means to set apart. Um, purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Now, his own special people, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 you guys want to go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> you know, he dwells in unapproachable light and we were called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Did you know that? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh my goodness it is crazy. But going back to Titus chapter two, verse uh, 14, where it says his own special people, the own special people, first Peter two, nine talks about a royal generation, like a royal priesthood. You, you and I, you know, it's so. If you do not understand the twenty-four elders in Romans, uh, in Revelation chapter uh, chapter four and five, if you do not know who the twenty-four elders are or what they uh, represent, you're really missing a beautiful uh, piece of the puzzle. It is so cool. Like when you understand, and I'm, just, but it, it, um, here it says his own special people zealous for good works. Now zealous for good works. Now, if you go back to, uh, let's go to Ephesians uh, chapter two In Ephesians chapter two, verse eight In Ephesians chapter two, verse eight, it says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, but lest anyone should boast. Now it says uh, the gift of God. Now, if you what is the gift of God? Um, let's flip over to Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23, trying to figure out what the gift of God is. In Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ our Lord. So going back to Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse uh, 10. So you have Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, which are like some of my favorite verses, but in Ephesians chapter two, verse 10, it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now you have this whole idea of good works. So if you go back to Titus chapter two, verse 14, at the end of verse 14, it says his own special people zealous for good works. If you are a Christian, um, you know, you have this whole, you have this whole relationship. So you have, you have, um, you know, some people say that Paul and James contradict each other because Paul is like saying for by grace, are you saved through faith? And then James is talking about, you need to have works mixed in there. And so you have like people like try to twist the scriptures and saying that it's a contradiction because they, they are saying two different things. They're not saying the same thing. No, they're not whatsoever, but faith alone, faith alone saves for by grace. Are you saved? Through faith. Faith alone saves 100%. But faith alone saves. But the faith that saves is never alone. And that's amazing. That, that's, that's an amazing quote. So faith alone saves, but faith that saves is never alone. And that is what is important. So here, Paul is writing to Titus, and he's saying his own special people, zealous for good works. Now remember, Paul was the most zealous of anybody. Paul was super zealous. Like, I mean, he, he was even almost bragging about it. He wasn't bragging about it, but he was he was basically giving his credentials. What was it in Philippians? I think it was. He was basically giving his credentials to prove a point. I want to, um, was it in Philippians? But he was basically saying, um, he's like, a, a, you know, a Hebrew of Hebrews, Pharisees of Pharisees. He's like of the tribe of Israel. He was a Benjamite, uh, Benjaminite, 
which means if, if you were from the tribe of Benjamin, then that was something to be envied in their culture because that was a big deal. And so Paul was like, you want to talk about bragging rights? Like I got all this and this and this. And so basically the whole picture there was that Paul was like saying as uh, concerning the law, as zealous as he could possibly be because he persecuted the church. He's like, I was so zealous. But now there's nothing wrong with being zealous unless it's being aimed at the wrong thing. Like, are you completely zealous in, for the gym? Like, I mean, I was talking to my buddy about that tonight. I was like, dude, you go to the gym like five hours a day. He's like, I was like, imagine how much, because I was trying to motivate him to get more into the word and like encourage him and whatnot. And like, he's like, oh man, I know I got, I've been thinking a lot about it. I was like, dude, use me. I was like, shoot me a message, text, text me whenever you want to. Like, I, I'm like, I'd love to talk to you about this kind of stuff, but is zealous for good works because people, people, who are looking at Christians, the only way that they can see Christ is if they are seeing Christ <laughs> through you. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. Your good works do not save you. It is Christ in Christ alone. That's the only way. But once you come to Christ, once you acknowledge what you have been saved from for the wages of sin is death, right? That means you deserve death. I do too. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Are you kidding me? And so once you understand, and so when you look at James, and, and we went through the book of James, when you understand where James was coming from, I need you, like James was the, the half-brother of Jesus Christ. So James was the half-brother of Jesus Christ, and he was writing down, the, the, he wrote the book of James, right? But you need to understand where James is coming from. James, growing up with Jesus, never never looked at Jesus as the Messiah. So James' whole life, he did not look at his brother, Jesus, as the Messiah. And so he was probably picking on him, you know, pushing him down the stairs, picking him up, you know, giving him a swirly, whatever they did back then growing up as boys do, right? And so you have to imagine how James probably looked at himself once he came to the realization that Jesus was Christ, that Jesus was the Messiah. And so James was coming from a point of understanding. He's like, I am not like I need to. What can I do to demonstrate my thanksgiving for what you saved me from? He's like, I want to do all of these things so that I can show you how much I'm thankful for. Because when you understand what you've been saved from, you're going to want to live so out loudly for that person that you're going to sh shout it from the, the mountaintops. And so that's what James wanted to do. He's like, what can I, I want to demonstrate, I want to prove this. And so like, and that's what's, that's what's kind of lacking in our world because we almost minimalize the cross. We almost take the cross and take the blood off of it and just put a cross there, forgetting that there was blood on it. And so we need to remember the price that was paid for our sins. And so when you remember what you were saved from, the cost that it took to save you from that sin that you were, you were, you were under the death penalty. Now, when you look at your life today, what are you doing with it? That's why I ask you guys all the time. Hey, are you a Christian? And you're like, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm like, awesome. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? And so that's what I'm challenging you guys. I want you guys to do something with it because like it is such a, it's like, it's like going into your backyard, digging, finding this treasure and then just taking it inside and hiding it and not telling a single person coming to Christ is such a beautiful thing. And when you get that, the thing, it's 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 mind blowing, and I totally can relate to everybody because it's it is scary going out to people and trying to tell people about Christ because you don't want them to look at you like you're weird and you don't know all the answers and you're scared and you don't know how to do it and what if they ask me this because I don't really know. But if you pray about it and you just do, God's gonna know your heart, and so that's what we need to be doing. Now that's just one, you know, that's just one part of the puzzle. But it's so it's okay. So going back to verse 14, he says his own special people zealous for his good work or for good works. We need to be doing things. Can people tell that you're a Christian? I told you guys about my atheist buddy. He would give the shirt off his back to people because he loves everybody. But when you compare that atheist to a Christian who's never told anybody that he's a Christian, what's the difference between that guy and a Christian who is doing the exact same thing? It's, uh, is there a difference? So anyways, going back to verse, uh, moving on, uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 15 in Titus chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Okay, so um, it says, uh, rebuke with all authority. It's interesting because um, if you have, you know, if you're, if you're firm in your foundation and you have the word of God backing you, it says rebuke in all, with all authority. 
you know, <laughs> judge in righteous judgment. The Bible says that we're not supposed to judge, right? Like that's what they tell us all the time. You're not judge, not lest you be judged. Well, then, you know, it also tells us to judge in righteous judgment because we need to be doing that. Like if you're a brother or sister in Christ and I see you messing up, I'm going to approach you and I'm going to try to bring you back in a the most loving way that I can possibly be. But at the same time, when I'm doing that, I need to remember that such were some of you because everything that you are or that you were, I was everything that is the worst thing ever created. That was me. And then Christ saved me. And so we need to remember that that once upon a time was me, but we forget. And so then we start looking down on people and we're like, how could you? Oh my gosh, you're disgusting. So we need to, we need to, we need to remember where we, where we come from. Okay. So let's get to Titus chapter three, um, Titus chapter three. In Titus chapter three, verse one, or I'm uh, so so just so you know where we're kind of going with Titus chapter three, guys. If you if you're new here, thanks so much for being here. My name is Ryan. Um, we're just going through the Bible book by book, and we are currently in Titus. We're going to be finishing Titus chapter three and being done with Titus. But I upload all of these on YouTube, and they are there's a link in my TikTok profile if you if you guys wanted to go subscribe over there because that's my only other social media. So if you subscribe over there, because if I get banned or if they ban TikTok, at least we'll have a way to keep in touch, and that'd be cool. But I upload all of these. We've done Revelation, Daniel, Ruth, Hebrews, James, John, Acts, Romans, all of those books. They're uploaded on YouTube, and they're they're kind of long. <laughs> I was talking to Amber about it. I was like, yeah. I was like, maybe I should shorten these videos because nobody like, can you imagine like not knowing, um, you know, like I know there's people in here who know me, but like for the people who don't know, and then they click on one of those YouTube videos and they see that it's four hours long, people don't want to watch four hours. And so it's just funny. I'm just like, I don't know, like people don't want to, you know, like, and so it's, you know, it's, it's hard finding time to do that and to, you know, chiseling out of your day. And so I'm thankful for you guys who have normal sleep schedules, who stay up and watch these with me, because I know you guys, a lot of you guys like, um, Jules and, um, Hotly, like you guys have normal sleep schedules and you know, I, I don't sleep. I didn't sleep good at all last night. Um, but like, here we are, we're doing it anyways. But anyways, um, four hours is, uh, is, is pretty intimidating when you click on one of those YouTube videos, but there's a lot in there and we cover a lot, obviously, if you've been here. You probably know. Oh, hello. I do. I can't get. <laughs> oh, thanks. Jeff. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to do it. I'm just saying that it's, it's very intimidating when somebody clicks on a video and they see that it's four hours long <laughs> because I would, I know exactly how they feel. I'd be like, I ain't watching that. Um, but anyways, let's go ahead and get into Titus chapter three. Hello from Illinois. Hello, Wendy. So let's go ahead and dive into Titus chapter three. So Titus chapter three is going to be talking about the church members. So if you're within a church, this is going to be uh, uh, applicable to you in some areas. So in Titus chapter three, verse one, it says, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities to obey, to be ready for every good work. Now that's interesting. Remind them. Who is he talking to? Remember the dynamics that's going on here. So Paul is writing to Titus and Paul is telling Titus to remind them. Who are them? He is reminding the church members. So Paul is telling Titus to remind the church members to subject or uh, to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. So the authorities, it's the office. It's the office that the person holds. It's not necessarily the person, right? And so it's interesting. That's not what we need to be doing. And it, it, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing, especially in our world today, like uh, trying to navigate what's right, what's wrong. How do we operate? Is this okay? Am I, what, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And there's a lot of uh, areas that we can only do the best things that we can do, but we can only make a decision based upon the t the, 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 the F, based upon the, the knowledge that we've gained um, that we've gained, but how much time have you invested in gaining knowledge? Um, so it's, 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 an, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, you know, like we, you can fall in line and just kind of close your eyes and just follow the leader, like hold on to the person's shirt in front of you and follow them wherever they're going. Or you can open your eyes and find out information for yourself and be like, you know what, this isn't right. I can't do that in good conscience. Like, no, I'm not going to fall in line. Like, okay, you're going to fire me. Go ahead and fire me. Like, that's not right. Like we need to do what's right before God. And that's what acts. Um, the first cut was, uh, I don't know. Um, 
uh, like Acts chapter four or something like that. It talks about how Peter was basically, you know, they were beaten and then they were cast out and then basically talked about how they counted it. They, they, they walked away after getting beat and they, count, they, they walked away rejoicing because they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Christ. And like, that's the mindset we need to have. Like if you get persecuted now, it doesn't have to be physically, you can be persecuted in all kinds of other different ways. Um, whether you didn't get a raise or that position, or you were trying to go to get this job or whatever, they looked at your, you know, your social medias and stuff like that. They saw who you were. There's all kinds of different persecutions. Um, but it's interesting that their mindset was that they walked away rejoicing because they, they were counted worthy to, um, suffer for his namesake. And wow, what a, what a cool thing. Okay, so we're going to be getting into um, the church members here. And so we need to remember that a saving faith produces a godly lifestyle. So if you uh, if you believe in a saving faith, then yours, that saving faith should, by a natural byproduct, produce a godly lifestyle. And so it, the question on the table is, do you believe in a saving faith? And if you do, then it should produce a godly lifestyle. And if it isn't, then then what's stopping it? It's it's it, 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 because if the Holy Spirit's in there, if he's in there, then he's trying to he's trying to work on you. Are you able? Are you quenching the Holy Spirit? Are you grieving the Holy Spirit? We've talked about that before. Did you know you can only grieve somebody that loves you? The Holy Spirit loves you. And uh, that's why you're able to grieve him. He loves you. He the Holy Spirit, the love. Uh, he, he loves you. OK, Titus chapter three, it says, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities to obey, to be ready for every good work to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. So we need to be a law abiding, right? There's some, you know, and you know, there's, there's hills that we can die on hills that we shouldn't die on. Um, what was that story? When um, Peter comes to Jesus and be, uh, they were talking about the whole taxing thing. And Peter tells Jesus to go ca cast a hook into the, the sea. And then he catches a fish and then there's a coin inside the fish. And they were going to give that coin to the people, the authorities at that time. And so they did that because they didn't want to offend. And that's interesting because there's been some pastors who died on the hill as far as like taxation goes right now. It's not right. Like what a lot of the, the, the authorities are doing. Um, a lot of it's not right, but you see Jesus, how he interacted with them. He didn't want to offend. And so we need to pick our hills, our battles wisely so that we can, um, you know, is it, it uh, uh, there, who, who is that? Uh, Kent Hoven. I don't know if you know who that is, but Dr. Kent Hoven, he's a creationalist and he, he, uh, he really focused on creation. I, I don't know if creationalist, is that a, even a word? I just made a I don't know if that's a word, but he, he really focuses on creation and he studies it a lot. He does a lot of interesting studies and puts things together together. But he, I think, went to prison for like a couple of years because he didn't pay taxes because he was fighting that battle. And so he, anyways, like, was he right? I don't know. But like what ended up suffering was his ministry. And so it's just it's the whole interesting thing. You know, was it worth it? No, because could he could he have continued doing a lot more if he just didn't die on that hill? You know, it's just one of those things. So it's interesting. So it goes. So Titus chapter three, verse two, it says to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. Now, humility, opposite of pride. We talk about pride all the time. Be if you be so be hyper vigilant about pride. Get the pride out of your life. You are not all that. You are not all that in a bag of chips. Right. Like we look at ourselves as if we're kind of a big deal. Especially like, especially on like social media, it's like people like can get a really big head because they got like a hundred thousand people following them, and that is a dangerous thing. And so you need to be very, very on guard and to lower yourself and to remember that you're not like I'm just a sinner, just like anybody else. But like we need to remember that type of stuff. But it says showing all humility to all men. Verse three, it says, for we ourselves were also once foolish disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. And I often bring us back to 1 Corinthians. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Like Brandon, I know, Jules. Gosh, Brandon is the worst. If you guys haven't been following Brando, you should go follow him because he tells me how cool he is every day. He even emailed me 
Um, but in First Corinthians chapter six, verse eleven, uh, this is Paul talking. In First Corinthians chapter six, verse eleven, it says, "And such were some of you." Now he says, "And such were some of you." After naming all of the things that are terrible, and so we need to remember that such were some of you. And so that's that. So that's that's such a good verse. I, I love I love that verse. Remember where you came from, and such were some of you. We need to remember, but sometimes we forget. Okay, so Titus chapter 3, verse 4, it says, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Okay, um, so this is, this is a really neat verse. So in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, it says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. For by grace are you saved through faith, and then not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works. So clearly, we're seeing it again, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Now, it goes on to say through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, the washing of regeneration. So when you so this is uh, idiomatic of the washing of regeneration. So if you guys remember in the Old Testament, you guys remember like the whole picture of like the tabernacle layout. You have this rectangle. So I want you to picture this rectangle. Right. And so down here, people like the, here, here's the tabernacle all the way up here, but to enter in. So you have this rectangle here and people want to go in. They have to go through this door that's down here first. There's only one way. There's only one way to get in. So you have this outer court, this, this fence area. And then within that fence, you have this, the tap, the, the tap, the, the tabernacle. So when you enter the, the, the outer gate, you walk in through the one door. Jesus says, I am the door. So there's one door that you walk into. And then once you walk into it, then you're in the outer court area. You see the, you see the tabernacle, you see the tent, right? But you're not in the tent yet. So you walk in and right when you walk in, the first thing you see is the altar where there's a burnt sacrifice on it. That's the first thing. That's the first thing you approach. Right when you walk in, the first thing you see is the, the sacrifice, right? And so that's the first thing you see. And so right when you walk past the sacrifice, the next thing you see is this laver. So like this, this bronze laver that you see, which was filled with water. So let's go, to, let's go to Exodus chapter 30. Let's go to Exodus chapter 30. Um, Exod, uh, Exodus chapter 30. Verse 18, um, well, Exodus chapter 30, verse 17, Exodus chapter 30, verse 17. In Exodus chapter 30, verse 17, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You shall also make a laver of bronze with its base also of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, and you shall put it put, put water in it. So, okay, so you have this at this fence, and then right when you would walk up, then you would see the, the, temp, the temple, the, or I'm sorry, the tabernacle. So you would walk in, you would see the altar, you would walk past the altar, you would see the bronze laver that was filled with water. And so these priests were supposed to wash their hands and their feet before they could go into the, the tabernacle. And so then once they entered the tabernacle, on the right, they would have the 12 pieces of showbread. On the left, they would have the menorah, the 12, you know, the seven candlesticks. And then right in front of them, once they walked in, they were in the holy place, they would have the altar of incense. Now that represents the prayers that go up. And then after, you, right behind the altar of incense, there would be the veil, which separated the holy place to the most holy place. And so once you walked past that veil, then you were in the then you were in the holy of holies or the most holy place. And only the high priest was allowed back there. And so you have the high priest could only go back there only under strict ceremonial preparation and they could only do that one time once a year and it was it was crazy the thing that they had to do in order for them to go back there because that is where his dwelling place was. That was Old Testament. And so now his the New Testament his dwelling place is within me. If, if, if you're born again, he is within you. And so it's crazy thinking about this, but going back to Titus chapter three, verse five, 
It says, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So you have this washing that is being done here. But let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Um, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, you know, this is the whole, this Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 to 33 is talking about, you know, uh, wives submit to your husbands, you know, husbands love your wives type of thing. So this is that passage. But in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, it says this, that he might sanctify and cleanse with her with the washing of the water of water by the word. So what I want you to focus on here is that Paul relates the cleansing experience here in uh, Titus chapter three, verse five. He's re he's relating this cleansing experience to the word of God. So this this cleansing experience is to the word of God. So what's interesting about this passage, though, is is that you have this whole you have this laver, this bronze laver. And so when when you, when you zoom out and you and you you remember the Old Testament like everything that they were doing was foreshadowing of everything to come right like that altar was about the sacrifice the sacrifice Jesus once you go past that then you have the the water the water sanctifying the water is representing of the word of God then you enter into the tabernacle to the right you have the 12 pieces of showbread the 12 pieces of showbread represent the 12 tribes of Israel the seven uh, candlesticks on the menorah the seven candlesticks represent the seven churches probably or the seven spirits of God some people just see it differently there but then you have the altar of incense the altar incense represent the prayers of the saints the prayers of the saints with uh, what and then you have the veil the veil that was torn and then you go into the holy of holies you have the ark of the covenant which was the outside of the ark was you know it was it was gold but the the ark of the covenant itself was made of wood so you have a wooden ark outer laid covered with gold so it, inside it was you, you know it, it could be deteriorated outside was gold but then on top of that ark of the covenant you have the mercy seat which was hammered gold it was nothing but pure gold and so you have this whole typology of everything that was going to happen on in the future and so here in titus chapter 3 where it's verse 5 where it's talking about the washing of regeneration and you think about how he's focusing the washing of the regeneration and he's using that as a way of relating to the word of God. And then you go to, Re let's go to revelation chapter four, everything like the whole, like the Holy spirit, he, he speaks in puns. It's really weird. It's like similitudes and, you know, he uses parables and all of these, these interesting things, but it's a pattern. It's a pattern from Genesis to Revelation. Everything is in pattern. So if you go to Genesis, uh, if you go to Revelation chapter four, verse six, Revelation chapter four, verse six, it says before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. But what I want you to focus on there is quite possibly, you know, I'll leave it to you. You can, you can decide. But here in Revelation chapter four, verse six, it says before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. Now, you know, everything here is, <laughs> I just complete, what is that word? It's mentioned in Hebrews. Okay, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23, it says, Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God. So you have everything up in heaven. Down here is a replica. We are, yeah, That's the word. We are like, this is a replica here, right? And so that's very fascinating to think about that. And so when you think about everything that they were doing back in the Old Testament, as far as you would walk in, there's a one door, specifically one door, then you would walk straight to the altar and the altar of sacrifice there. And then after the altar of sacrifice, you would have the bronze and laver. And inside that bronze and laver was the sea of glass. You have that sea of glass mentioned. Hey, thank you. So Rose, you have that sea of, or the bronze laver is, it seems to be 
emblematic of the sea of glass that is in Revelation chapter 4, verse 6. Now, I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that it's very interesting to see how everything is a very structured. There is an architecture here that is going on, and it's just so crazy when you start putting this type of stuff together. It's fascinating. It is on purpose. And so you have these visions, you know, from, you know, Ezekiel had his, you know, with the, you know, the wheels and the stuff. Then you have Daniel with the, you know, the, you know, his son, like the, the, the ancient of days and the son of man, you know, like all that. And then you have, um, John on the island of Patmos, you have everything that he saw, and they're explaining things. They're explaining supernatural things to us in a way that you and I can understand, but it's not it, like, how do you explain something that you've never experienced before, right? Like, that's the, that's the, that's the obstacle. That's the barrier that we're trying to, we're, we can't really fully understand, but it, it, it's really cool. Anyways, Titus chapter three In Titus chapter three, verse five, it says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our savior. That having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's cool. So verse 7, it says that having been justified, justified, past tense. That is something when you gave your life to Christ, whether it was yesterday, five days ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, you got justified once and for all. I believe if saved, you are always saved. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. But um it's uh, it says that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. It's crazy. That is crazy. The hope of eternal life. That is the gift of God. Remember Romans 6, 23 for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That is the gift of God according to the hope of eternal life as verse seven says. Okay. Uh, Titus chapter three, verse eight, it says, this is a faithful saying. And these things I want to, you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Now, OK, so let's go to Isaiah chapter uh, 64. We've been here before. It's important to like, OK, um, people say like you need to earn your salvation, right? But in Isaiah chapter 64, verse six, in Isaiah chapter 64, verse six, it says, but we are all like an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. So our righteousness is as filthy rags. It's disgusting. Now to get a little bit more graphic, filthy rags here has the idea of menstrual rags. Like it's like something like pretty graphic, right? But that's what it's like to God. It's it's disgusting. Like get it like get get that away from me type of thing. That's how it's described here. And so it's very graphic, but it tells us, you know, we need to remember that our righteousness is as filthy rags, but we need to also remember to maintain good works because our our good works is pretty much the only evidence that the unsaved people in the world have that we belong to God. And so we need to live godly lives so that we might win some. Remember, we, we talked about the verse, uh, uh, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. Now, it's not a works-based salvation. Absolutely not. It is by faith. It is for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But what we said before, faith alone saves but faith that saves is never alone. And so that's, that's, that's a good thing to remember. Um, if you are saved, awesome. What are you doing with it? Okay, Titus chapter 3, verse 9, it says, But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. So um, uh, this goes back to what we talked about before. We need to win souls, not arguments. We are called to win souls, not arguments. People want to debate and they want to divide and they want to do this, 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 and this and tell everybody how much smarter they are than you. And it's interesting, you know, you got to be strategic as a Christian and be like, you know what, you might be right, but what about this? And like, be like, okay, you know, okay, but let's talk about this. And, you know, 
do what you can so that you um, might win their soul. Because that's what we're supposed to try to do. Win souls, not arguments. Okay, but in Titus chapter 3, verse 10, it says, Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. Now, if you want to know what a heretic is, um, you guys probably hear that word a lot. You know, I probably have been called it a handful of times by people in here. I don't know. Um, but people throw that word around a lot. But a heretic is one who, you know, if you click on the word division in or divisive in Titus chapter 3, verse 10, it says reject a divisive. Now I read a new King James. I don't know what yours is, but reject a divisive man. Now the word divisive there is heretic. It's a, it's actually, it's heretic. So a, a heretic is divisive. And if you guys remember, hopefully you do, because in Proverbs, go to Proverbs chapter six, we're going back to it because we need to know what God hates. Proverbs chapter six. If you guys don't know it, you need to know it in Proverbs chapter six, verse 16. Proverbs chapter six, verse 16, it says, these things, these six things, the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devised, devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies and one who sows discord among the brethren. So that's one of the things that God hates, like a divisive person, somebody who gets in there and tries to just manipulate and divide the body. Can you imagine? Christ looks at the church as his body. That's why when Jesus showed up to Saul, when he was on his road to Damascus, he's like, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, Saul wasn't directly persecuting Jesus himself, but Saul was persecuting the church. But Jesus, from Jesus's point of view, which is the only point of view that matters, his perspective, Jesus was looking at that as he was attacking his own body. <laughs> That's crazy. So if you're a part of the church, if you're a part of if the you're a part of the body, you're the bride. It's this crazy. I, I, it's on. It's above how we can wrap our minds around. But it's interesting. And so when you think about that and then you understand that God hates somebody who is dividing or sows discord among the brethren, when you divide the brethren and you, you separate them, that's dividing the body. And that God hates that. Like, it's obvious. Like, it makes so much more sense, like, why God would hate that. So here in verse 10, uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 10, it says, reject a divisive man or a heretic. Re reject a heretic. Reject a heretic after the first and second admonition. Mean try once, try twice. After that, got to get out of here, man. Okay, so in Titus chapter 3, verse 11, it says, Knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. Okay, then we get to verse 12. And it says in verse 12, it says, when I send Artemis to you or Ty Tychus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. So some people theorize that here in verse 12, that Artemis is one of the 70, you know, um, that, that Jesus brought into the fold. Do you, you guys remember? Let's go to Luke chapter 10. Um, Luke chapter 10. Because in Luke chapter 10, it said, Luke chapter 10, verse 1, and Luke chapter 10, verse 1, it says this, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. So if you guys remember, we talked about this before, but just in case you forget, there's this outer circle made of 70 disciples. That's what we just read about Luke chapter 10. But then on the it, the, the medium or a little bit within that circle, you have the 12, 12 disciples, right? So you have the 70 disciples and a little bit closer, you have the 12 disciples. And then a little bit in the inner circle, you have the close intimate inner circle that was the closest to the Lord, which is Peter, James, and John. So you have 70, then you have 12, and then you have three. So, so when you think about Titus chapter three, verse 12, you have this guy named Artemis and people theorize that he was one of the 70. 
that we just read about in Luke chapter 10, verse 1. You know, it doesn't really matter. You can take it or leave it. It's not like a, you know, it's not like a doctrinal issue. It's just, you know, just something good to know. But it might not be accurate. It's just what some people believe. So I don't, I don't really know. But in verse 13, it says, Send Zenas, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey with haste, that they may lack nothing. Okay, so uh, Zenus, I guess, Zenus, Zenus, uh, this was, this guy was a Jewish scribe um, and a lawyer. But we, but what's interesting is that P Apollos is mentioned here. And if you guys remember, let's go to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. Let's go to Acts chapter 18. Because in Acts chapter 18, you have this guy that you we're introduced to. In Acts chapter 18, verse 24. In Acts chapter 18, verse 24, it says, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So you have this guy. He is out there being bold in everything he's saying, and he's like, Listen up, guys. This is how it's going to be. This is what it is, and this is how it is. You got to pay attention. Write it down. And so Apollos, he's being bold, doing what we should be all should, all should be trying to do in, in our own way. But he's he only has information to this point. He's not up to date. He needs an update. He needs to connect to Wi-Fi and schedule the two in the clock two two a.m. update for iOS whatever it's at right now. And so it's just interesting to see this guy. He's doing what he knows to do, but he doesn't have all the information. And so when you read on, it says, verse 26, it, so, it says, uh, Acts chapter 18, verse 26, it says, so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Aquila and Priscilla heard him. They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So Jesus died on the cross. He rose again on the third day, but Apollos didn't know that. So Apollos was teaching the way of John the Baptist and because he didn't know the, the most recent events. And so it's interesting because you see Aquila and Priscilla and they took him aside. They didn't, you know, yell at him and make fun of him because he didn't have the information. No, they pulled him aside. They had a private conversation with him. They updated him. And then he went right back out there and he told everybody else because it says in verse 27, Acts chapter 18, verse 27, it says, and when he desired to cross the Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Again, showing from the scriptures, this dude, Apollos, was a, a maniac. I love this guy. I don't know much about him, but I, I love this guy because he was just going all over the place. He's like, you're not going to stop me. And I, again, pay attention to verse 28 because it says showing from the scriptures. Now, when you see the scriptures, what are you supposed to think of? It's the Old Testament. So Apollos was refuting the Jews publicly, and he was telling them from the Old Testament why Jesus is the Messiah. That's crazy. Can you show somebody, here's a test, here's a test, we talked about this before, but can you personally show somebody using only the Old Testament how Jesus is the Messiah. Can you show it? Like you, I know you can talk about it in the New Testament because, you know, you just flip the page and like you'll find, you know, it talks about it. But can you do it from the Old Testament? There's a test for your knowledge. Can you do it? If you can, good for you. That's awesome. If you can't, might want to, you know, try to figure out how you can do that because it's important to know. Because if you ever stumble upon a Jewish person, you're going to need to use the Old Testament in order to win them for the Lord or at least to get their brains thinking. Because... They don't believe in the New Testament. Okay, so let's go to Titus chapter 3, verse 14. In Titus chapter 3, verse 14, it says, And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. Um, okay, so learn. We need to learn, obviously, how to think. <laughs> That's what we say that all the time. But uh, verse 15, some are, uh, bringing it to a close, it says, All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Now, again, just because I don't know who's here and who wasn't here, but grace be with you all. Amen. In Titus chapter 3, verse 15, it says, grace be with you all. Amen. Now, this was a very Pauline type of style. This was his signature. This was his signature. He was telling people, you're going to know the authentication of my letters 
because of how I signed my epistles. His letters would always be signed very similarly. And here, it's always going to be incorporating grace. Grace. Grace is such a Pauline type of style of writing. It's unbelievable. So let's go to um, 2 Thessalonians real fast. Just turn pages over a handful of times. But in 2 second, in second Thessalonians um, chapter 3, verse 17, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 17, it says, The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle. So I write. And here it is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 18. Here is the sign that everybody shall know that it's an actual letter from Paul. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So it's grace, grace, grace. Paul is the only apostle who incorporates grace in the conclusion or benediction or whatever you want to call it, the end of a letter Paul is the only one who incorporates grace as his closing statement. The only other person who does is Peter, but Peter doesn't use it the way Paul uses it. Paul says, grace be with you. Peter uses it as, I, I, I forget exactly how he words it. It's good. Oh, you can see for yourself. I think it's second Peter. Second Peter. Oh yeah. Second Peter chapter three, verse 18. Peter uses it. He says, but grow in the grace. So, Peter says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it's a completely different context. Paul uses it by saying, grace be with you all. Amen. Right? Like that's the way he says, grace be with you. Grace be with you. Grace be with you. Paul or uh, Peter says, grow in the grace. So it's a completely different dynamic. And so it's just, it's just interesting. Um, and obviously Paul had to, in Paul had to um, underscore that fact because the Thessalonica church received a forgery, a letter that somebody wrote as if it was from Paul. And so you can say that there's 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and 3 Thessalonians because somebody wrote a fake letter to him. And that's what a lot of people think. Um, and so that's why Paul is like, hey, don't listen to any letter that you ever get unless it has my signature, unless it has my John Hancock at the end of it. It says, grace be with you all. Amen. That is a Pauline kind of way of wrapping things up. And if it doesn't have it there, then it's not from me. That's basically what he was talking about. But that is uh, Titus chapter one, two and three. So hopefully that was good for you guys. That was a, that was a, that was a short one. Um, but um that's what I want you. The one thing I want you to know more than anything is how to know for sure you can get to heaven. There's only one way, and that is by believing that Jesus is God's son, that he led a sinless life, that he died on the cross for your sins, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day. And the Bible says, for whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's unbelievable. It is a free gift. It is a free gift. Man, and I'm telling you what, guys, uh, like the time time could be running real short. I believe that I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I think it could happen quite literally at any minute, at, at any minute. It is something you gotta, you, if you don't know Christ and you're not sure, feel free to message me here on TikTok. I, I would love to talk to you. Um, you don't need to follow me here on TikTok. My messages are open for anybody and everybody. So, um, yeah. If I, I upload all these uh, videos up on YouTube, there's a YouTube link up in my TikTok profile. If you guys wanted to go follow me over there, there's a YouTube link. Click on that YouTube link and then go follow me. It's the only other uh, social media I have. So if they ban TikTok, then at least we'll be able to stay in touch. But um, yeah, that's what I got for you guys. Um, short and sweet. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> How long was it? Does anybody know? Um, about three and a half hours or so. Yeah, not bad. Hey, thanks, Grandma Sue. I'm glad your husband's doing so much better. That is so cool. Gotta go. Thanks. Have a good night, Shelba. Thanks for being here the whole time. Thanks, Chelsea. Thanks. <laughs> Candy, thank you. You're too, so kind. Um, yeah. Um, I, I actually didn't expect you to stay the whole time, but thanks for being here the whole time, Chelsea. Very cool. Uh, Kellogg, uh, Philemon next. I thought about doing Philemon next. I actually thought about doing it. <laughs> thanks, Gina. Uh, have a good night, Marley. You guys are too kind with those gifts. Um, I'm glad I caught you. Very cool. I'm glad you caught me. Um, I don't know. I actually thought about doing Philemon's very short book. It won't take long at all. I don't know what's next, honestly. I don't know. 
I uh, don't know. I am trying to figure that out myself. Um, yeah, Candy, thank you. Thank you so much. Wow, you made it. Uh, have a good night, Barb. Thanks for being here. What what should we do next? Let's say we done we, we have completed John. Man, we're moving right along. <laughs> I kind of want to do Matthew. Cause there's a lot of there's a lot I just don't know how to do I haven't really figured it out yet. I want to because 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 in order to do Matthew, you almost de- need to do Mark and Luke all at the same time. So it's like, I, what's the most effective way to do it? I don't know. Um, when might you be on next? Um, maybe tomorrow night. Revelation again. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah, why does everybody want Isaiah? Heck yeah, my mom loves that book. Oh, she likes Matthew, Nick. I didn't know that. That's cool. Um, Jules, why do you why do you want Isaiah? You've said Isaiah a handful of times. What? Why do you guys? Why do you guys? What is the reason you you want Isaiah? I'm I'm curious. Is that your favorite book? Why is Isaiah your favorite book? Galatians. We've done. Uh, we've already completed Galatians and Garcia. That's up on YouTube. If you wanted to go check it out, it is up. It was a good book. It was a good study. Revelation again. Don't you tempt me with a good time. Jude. Ooh. Oh, you know what? Hmm. That might be good. That's actually probably going to be long. Maybe. Maybe. Lots of prophecy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, man. Zechariah. Ooh, Zechariah would be a good one. I actually thought about doing Zechariah before we started diving into all these Pauline epistles, just because Zechariah is, is, is I, I enjoy that one, too. Yes. Ezekiel. Ooh. Anthony. What's up, man? Proverbs. Candy. Oh, man. Ecclesiastes 3. There, uh, time for everything. Huh. So many. <laughs> Lots of prophecy. Yeah, there is a lot of prophecy in Isaiah. Oh, man. I, if I tell you what, you guys catch me on the wrong day and I'm going to be a hot mess. I don't even know if I'll be able to get through Isaiah 53. I about lost it the other night. I don't know what my problem is. Um, Joel, you decide. <laughs> Romans, we did. Uh, Marley, we did Romans already. That was a good one. That was a fun one. Um, that one's up on YouTube, too, if you're interested. We just did that one, I don't know, probably like two months ago, maybe. Have a good night, Monami. Thank you so much for those gifts. You are too kind, and you don't have to do it. Um why I lost it? What do you mean, Picky? Hello, Picky. Psalms. <laughs> Go ahead and knock out these. Uh, oh, man. That would take forever. I loved Romans. Yeah, that was a good one. I enjoyed that one a lot, too. Man, Jude might be fun. Jude, Zechariah. That was good. That was good. But Matthew. Uh, I still feel like I'm learning so much about like the Jewish culture. So I, I would like to learn a little bit more before we dive into Matthew. Maybe, I don't know. It's challenging. It's really hard to, um, Corinthians would make sense because, you know, we haven't, you know, just to do the Pauline, finish the Pauline epistles since we're on the Pauline train. So that could be, that could also because I think the last three that we have haven't done is first and second Corinthians and then Philemon. Um, Corinthians. Oh man, could be very dicey. <laughs> Just to thank you will suffice, and we need. Uh, and yes, we need to die. Well, you don't need to. I, I every time I say something like that, Monami, I hope you, you. I hope you're not taking it as if like give me anything. I 
never, um, want you guys to feel obligated in any kind of way to ever do anything like that because I am, that's not why I'm here for, I'm not here for any, you know, money or anything like that. I'm just here because I think we're, we're just doing a Bible study and it's fun. It's challenging me. And, uh, that's the biggest thing. So the reward is that I have is more than enough. You know, like what I'm learning myself is more than enough. And so um, I really appreciate your guys' heart and wanting to give me gifts and stuff like that, but it's never necessary, but I, I do appreciate it. Um, well, thank you, Monami. Quick question. As a second method, can you study the Bible simply by using cross-references? Um, <laughs> oh, because you got the same Bible I got. <laughs> um, the, the Schofield Study Bible that you have, DJ Nick, it, it's the same one I have. And it's good. And it does. I, I, I'm sure you're probably asking that question because I like we go a lot of places that are not referenced in the, the margins. So they Schofield does a good job at making connections d during his time. But there's there's a lot more like and so you can make your own connections and draw your own you know lines and stuff like that. You can study it really well by diving into the margins and the references that he provides, but there's a lot more to it. And so it's, it's good to understand that, but also what, what we go through over here, it's good to understand that there's even so much more than what we talk about. Like we talk about all this stuff, but there's so much more and there's so much more and it just keeps unfolding and unpacking and unwinding and untwisting, but all still being held together all at the same time. And it's unbelievable. And so, just keep diving in, man. Have fun with it. It is a beautiful book. It's unbelievable. 60, uh, uh, 66 books written by 40 different authors from a period of thousands of years. And it's held together. And one compliments the other. The other compliments the other. And it, it's just unbelievable. Written by prophets, pri uh, priests, kings, fishermen, like all kinds of people from all different walks of life. And it's all held together. And you're like, yeah, this is a random chance, right? And people still believe that we existed, you know, the Big Bang Theory. And it's just like, how in the world can people still believe that? That is an amazing, terrible lie that has been th thrown out into our culture. And it's been believed on it's heartbreaking. Um, oh man, I don't, <laughs> and Garcia, thank you. I, uh, I write down a lot of stuff in my Bible to remember, to help trigger a uh, thought because I forget a lot of stuff. And honestly, I forget a lot more than I learn. but I'm retaining a lot of stuff. Um, you know, they, they say, uh, um, the best way to remember something is to teach it because it forces you to learn it. <laughs> so that's, what's being done to me. So, um, it's, it's taught in schools and that's why people will still believe it. I know, man, that is, that is, or, uh, sorry, ash, ashtray, trash. Um, yeah, that's heartbreaking. Yeah. The big bang theory. Um, I also use blue letter Bible. Yeah, too. I have the same Bible. Do you really Gina? That is so cool. I didn't know that. Have a good week. You too. Mystics sage. Um, but yeah, it is a pleasure to witness the whole book of third party stories full of people. What? I don't know what that's referring to. Yeah, guys. Um, can you tell me what sound doctrine means again, please sound doctrine? You know, it's just the, the difference between life and death, like spiritually. So sound doctrine, what is sound doctrine? It is the gospel. What is the gospel? First Corinthians 15, one through four, that is everything. If you deviate in any kind of way on that, which is the foundation of everything, the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you remove the resurrection from the Bible, you take away everything. You take away the hope. You, you take away everything. And so sound doctrine is the gospel, which can be found in first Corinthians 15, one through four, that Christ was, uh, that, that Christ died according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Anybody who teaches anything other than that, it said, I mean, it's heartbreaking because you have other people out there and you guys need to be mindful of this. There are people out there who teach something very similar to that, but they add on one little thing and they say, you need to get water baptized as well in order to be saved. And that is, that is what Galatians, the book of Galatians is all about. It's Paul was writing to the churches in Galatia about them receiving a different gospel 
And even if it's manipulated a little bit, it is different. It's kind of like if I give you a hundred dollar bill, you're going to be like, okay, thank you. And it's real. You take it. It's a real hundred dollar bill. But if I give you a hundred dollar bill that looks so similar and everything looks the same way, but it's different in one fact in one, one area, then it's wrong. And that is what they're doing to the gospel. They're manipulating it. And so if you believe that salvation is through Christ and Christ, uh, that you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, rose again the third day, sounds really good. But if you add water baptism to it, the question on the table is, is that a different gospel? Because now you're adding something to it. And so it's very important to understand what it is that you're believing in. It is through Christ and Christ alone. Because if you, if you could get saved by just going underwater and coming back up again, then what you're saying is Christ, what Christ did on the cross wasn't enough. Now, should we get baptized? Absolutely we should, but it's not a means of salvation. You're saved before that if you gave your life to Christ. So that's why it says, for by grace are you saved through faith. You are saved through faith and then not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Because if you could earn your salvation by being a good person, then Christ wouldn't have had to die at all. And that's all talked about in Galatians chapter 2. So that would be uh, sound doctrine. Uh, what do you think of the book of Wisdom of Solomon or the rest of the Apocrypha? I, you know, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't know um, what you know um, in, uh, in Garcia. I don't know what you know. And I don't know what you don't know. But for me... There are 66 books here. And so I am going to pour myself into this. And I'm going to stay here because to me, this is home. So, you know, there's people who really like studying the book of Enoch and, you know, the gospel of Mary or Barnabas or whatever. Like they study those other ones. And I'm just like, you know, when people get very interested in like all of these other books, that the Bible mentions and they're like, well, what about this? And then they say that the Bible's not complete and it's so dangerous. You get down the slippery slope. And so what happens when you, for me, this is my opinion, you know, to each his own people like deviating. And then once they deviate, then they get away from the Bible and then they come to the conclusion almost not always. Sometimes they come to the conclusion that maybe it's not complete. And then now there's a little, seed of doubt dropped into their brain and it doesn't take much a little drop one drop of something wrong into a pure glass of water can contaminate the entire thing and so it's you, you got to be very very cautious and so what i always tell people is i just say stay as close to the bible as you possibly can do you want to have a bible study okay don't go and buy a book and you know go through a book that talks about some of the things that are in the bible no, if you want to have a Bible study, use the Bible. <laughs> like, so for me, and this is what I would, you know, encourage everybody else to do. Just stay as close to the word as you possibly can. If you believe in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you believe that, then why, you know, some, and I'm not saying this is you because I don't know where you're coming from, but there's some people who think that this is an incomplete. And so if you believe in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you believe that verse, then there's no problem believing that God can contain his message all throughout time. There's nothing that's going to stop it. This is going to be here forever. So, um, yeah, for me, I stay as close to this as I possibly can. I don't have time to go and study all the other things. Like, I, 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 I'm not going to mess with it. There's, there's some interesting things in the book of Enoch, but you know, when you start deviating, you start getting the idea of, you start getting, you know, persuaded or pulled a little bit to maybe it's a little bit of a workspace salvation. And that's kind of what they start leading you down that type of uh, tunnel. And uh, we got to be cautious. And so I just avoid it altogether. And I just stay as close to this as I possibly can. So that is what I, uh, that's, that's me. I don't know if I just kept on going there and round around about, but that's me. Hey, uh, thanks, Nick. Great study, Ryan. Have a great night. See you tomorrow night. Thanks, man. Agree. Okay, cool. <laughs> Apocrypha says to pray for unalive people. Sheesh. Sounds very Catholic oriented. Yeah. Have a good night, Jules. Yeah. Um, 
guys, I'm, I'm probably going to be wrapping up here, but if you guys didn't follow me over on YouTube, there's a YouTube link up in my tech talk profile profile. I'd appreciate if you follow me over there just in case I do get banned. I'm actually glad I didn't get banned tonight because we talked about some dicey stuff that is not very popular, especially in Titus chapter two. So that's encouraging that nobody reported me. So, um, it's actually been a while since I've been banned. Was it like probably like six months now? So that's good. Um, but you know, everything that's going on over in Israel, you know, I want you guys, I'm trying to, the, the hope here is number one, that you guys come to Christ. Um, what is your YouTube name? Um, there's a YouTube, it, it, there's a link. If you click up on my TikTok profile here, um, there's a little YouTube icon. Once you click there, you'll see a YouTube icon in my bio. Uh, just click on that YouTube and it'll take you right there. Um, and then if, if, if you can't find it, maybe somebody can post it, the name of it on here, and then I can just pin it. But um, I want you guys to know, number one, the hope of this entire study that we're doing is, number one, if you don't know Christ, hopefully hopefully you can come to know Christ through this study. That's, that's the number one goal. The second goal that I have, if you, if you are a Christian, is that you're, like, I, I hope to stir you up. I want to stir you up so badly because let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10. I want to stir you up so badly. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, it says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some but exhorting one another and so much more the, as you see the day approaching. So I want to stir you up. Why? Because that's what we should be doing. It's like a picture, you know, I used the analogy last time, picture of glass of orange juice and all of the stuff settles to the bottom. And so when you get a spoon, you stir it up and then it all starts floating and it takes the color that it should have had to begin with. My point is, is that is everything is everything. If you're a Christian, is everything settled down? If you have a cup of water or a cup of orange juice here, is everything settled down here because it hasn't been activated in a while? What I want to do, the hope at least, is to stir that up within you so that you get excited. I want to encourage you guys to get in here, get this all over you. And so once it's in, once it's in here, once it's in here, once it's in here, it's going to come out of here. And then once it comes out of here, it's almost like you can't help yourself. Like you need to tell somebody. It's like, I have been like, I just not, like, how do you not want to tell somebody about this stuff? Like it is just, it is unbelievable. And so that's what I hope to put on you guys, because after you come to Christ, my hope is to stir you up. Um, thank you. This is it right here. Thank you, Gina. This is up. Oh, oh gosh. Why did it? Why is it a? Uh, can you guys even see that? Why is that strange? Um, it's TT replays on YT, TikTok replays on YouTube. Can you guys see that? I don't know, it looks weird on my, my end. But um, it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So encourage each other. Yeah, but encourage each other so much the more as you see the day approaching. Sheesh! Like, that is crazy. <laughs> like, what? So, like, we need to be... Mm. So, hopefully I can motivate you. I will be your guys' biggest hype man. I mean, <laughs> I want to bump you up. That's why I tell you guys. Like, if you guys ever tell somebody about Christ, let me know. Because, I, I mean, that encourages me. Because now I'm just like, I got to go do it. Like, I, I got to do it. Like, I've done it uh, twice, like, within the past week, and I'm just, like, I'm pretty happy about that, like, that's, that's good, like, it doesn't happen all the time, like, I don't see too many people, you know, if you, if you take this TikTok thing away, like, I don't see physically too many people too often, but I was, it was, it, uh, it, I had the opportunity to do it two times this week, and you know, it was awesome, so I leave today, and um, I leave the house, and my little girl, she is, uh, what is it, uh, five, um, she runs up to me as I'm leaving and she runs up to, to me and she says, give somebody a track. <laughs> and she like hugs onto my leg, like a koala bear. 
And I was just like, that was so cool. Like, I mean, unprovoked, you know, just like me leaving. And I just loved it. I loved it because like she is seeing it and she's, you know, we're, we're trying to be that example for her. And that's what we need to be doing. And so my little girl, she's five. She's pumping me up. I'm like, let's go. And so I love it. And so, um, you know, we need to stir one another up. And even though she's five, she's stirring me up. And I'm just like, man, like I'm giving that to her. She's giving it back to me. We're ping ponging off of one another. Yeah. Train up a child. Is she's, yeah. It is so cool. It is so cool. But that's what I'm hoping to do with you guys to stir one another up by encouraging one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching guys, I am telling you, and I'm not, I could be wrong. It might not be for another thousand years, but as I see the time approaching, as I see everything happening in our world, everything happening in America, all the CBDCs, all of like the, the, the invasion, all of what they're doing to us, the darkness coming into our world, you know, like Christ is going out. We're le- like, you know, Romans one seems to be overpowering America right now. I mean, everything happening over in Israel specifically, if you guys are ever trying to pay attention to prophetic times, focus solely on Israel. Israel is God's timepiece. And so you're seeing everything. You're seeing Russia. You're seeing Iran. You're seeing Turkey. You're seeing America. Everybody is over there right now. The stage is set. Sure seems like the day is approaching. You know, I'm not a meteorologist, but uh, if you're paying attention to the weather, you know, they can be wrong 100% of the time and still have a job. But you and I, we can, you know... (laughs) I mean, we are supposed to be mindful of these things. And if you're paying attention, which I'm sure you are, we are seeing everything and it's unreal. So it's also, again, very evident of the scriptures, because if you if you apply as you see the day approaching, how could they have seen the day approaching during their time? Because they were only they were local, you know, news. It took like it took like six months for news to travel. Like I told you before, like when, when an emperor died, it took six months for that news to reach the military. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's just, uh, it's just interesting to pay attention to this type of stuff. So now we pay attention because you look at your phone and you're up to date on what just happened in Taiwan. They had a 7.4 uh, earthquake. You have buildings toppling over. You have the embassy being attacked or not embassy, but the, but that military commander for the Iranian, um, uh, what was it Hezbollah or it was Iranian? I can't remember, but you know, it was right across the street from where the Iranian embassy was. You're seeing it's they're, they're getting so like they're, they're getting, they're pushing it. It's trying to see how far over the line they can go. And it's just like, man, it's just, as you see the day approaching, I don't know what else we could really, you know, if, if I told you to write down what, what it, what it means to be as, as you see the day approaching, if I gave you a piece of paper and a pencil, and I told you to write it down. I feel like we would write down what's happening in our world right now. It's unbelievable. Uh, Josh, please forgive me for attacking you the other night. I'm sorry. If you did, it's okay. I don't remember that. Um, I didn't see it. What are your thoughts on Calvinism? Um, You know, thank you. I'm stirring me up just by listening to you. I'm new here. Very cool, Mill. Awesome. I, that's awesome. Um, Guac, guacamole. Molly, 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 guacamole. Um, but what are your thoughts on Calvinism? You know, I think uh, I think Calvinists um, we see things differently, but I think some of them, um, I think they can still be you know Christians. You know, I think a lot of them believe in the gospel. I think we just, I think they just they have different. They they focus a lot on elect and predestination and whatnot, and I I think we me compared to like a five point Calvinist I don't know what you're referring to as Calvinism are you talking about five point four point three point where because there's different levels of them, but you know I mean if they believe in the gospel you know it's tough you know that's uh, that's uh, that's that's if they believe in the gospel then let's go amen but. Uh, it is, uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. I, um, um, I actually ran into a Calvinist. I think she said she was a three point Calvinist and we had an actual, we had a conversation. And so I, I told her some of the things in, so we had a, we had a fun conversation. It was nothing, you know, bad or anything like that, but she believed what I believed as far as how to obtain salvation. So that's awesome. So if that's good, then okay, let's go. 
we had different perspectives on some other things, but I would liken that to be secondary issues. So, so if it's not something that re relates to salvation, then it is a secondary issue. So I don't know if that helps in any kind of way. Okay. But Isaiah 60 verse one will happen soon. Revelation approaching arise and shine for your light. Yeah. Um, nothing Christians fear more than feeding the hungry, helping the poor, welcome, welcoming the immigrants. <laughs> oh man. Sheesh. Sad to realize what's happening and they can manipulate weather and earthquakes. Yeah, Candy. No joke. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it really makes you question a whole bunch of stuff. Like, has everything we've been told been manipulated? Sure seems like it. You realize that Revelation was written about Nero, right? Ooh, you seem to be very confident in that kind of statement. Why are you so confident? What makes you... What makes you... What makes you think that and uh, what makes you right and me wrong? Uh, that's an interesting thing. Seems like you're betting an awful lot. It has been written. The prophecy is playing out. <laughs> okay. Well, guys, if you guys have any questions about, oh, um, Calvinists believe you have to be chosen to go to heaven, don't they? Yeah, in a roundabout way. Uh, they believe if you're elect, you're going to come to Christ no matter what happens. It's bound to happen, which means that it, some of them, not all of them, believe that you don't have to go out and tell people about Christ because you're going to come to Christ no matter what they do. And so, you know, you can you can become a little bit sluggard, like a, a sluggard or lazy-ish in a, in a sense um, when it comes to evangelizing, you know, and, you know, we're told in the synoptics to occupy till he comes. Um so that's what we need to be doing. Following you on YouTube. Thanks again. Have a good night, uh, morning, and take care. Thanks, Blondie. I appreciate it. Okay, guys. Well, I'm out of here. Um, hopefully, I'll see you guys tomorrow. And if I see you guys tomorrow, that'll be awesome. I will let you guys know on a TikTok story, if what time, probably. And uh, tell somebody about Jesus. Tell somebody about Jesus, if you can. If you have any questions, feel free to message me here directly on TikTok. I would love to talk to you. And uh, if not, that's completely okay. But you guys stay safe. And um, hopefully I will see you tomorrow around midnight or so. But uh, if not, then uh, I'll see you here. I'll see you there. Or I will see you in the air. Woo! Let's go. All right. See you guys. Have Be safe.